You're on the Six Screens Telenetwork, earning the reputation of giving all the right ingredients, uninhibited, and exposing the hard, cold facts about the Watchtower Society. And now, here's Disney. Well, we welcome everyone in tonight for a program, our premiere program for tonight, Barbara Anderson. Watchtower Researchers Speaks Out, She Tells All. She's on with us tonight. We all love Barbara. I've been getting emails all week. You're looking forward to the program. We have done some adjustments on her microphone. I believe you'll see that is better here tonight for her. And we're so glad that we have Barbara coming on and wanting to speak with us tonight. So I'm going to bring Barbara into the feed. And uh, Barbara, hello, Barbara Anderson. Well, it's nice to be here this evening, and I do hope that you can hear me, because I don't want to talk for an hour and a half and nobody can hear me. Well, that wasn't totally the case, but I think people, uh, I think people can hear you better now, now that I adjusted the microphone. Uh, is that better, Christine? Is that better, Thomas? What do you think? Let us know. Yeah, I think uh, I think it's better. Hi, Rick. Hi, yeah. Rick. Yeah. Uh, it's a little better, yeah. A little better, but it's it's still it's, it's, has a strange uh, it's echo. echo. It's a it's I I can't explain it, but it's a little louder, but it's still a little bit. All right. Something well, we can't, about we, we, we can't make we, we can't make it perfect. But are you listening on YouTube yeah. or just the telephone line? Uh, telephone line. If you listen on YouTube, it's a lot clearer -er, it, and clearer. Oh. So, I mean, they, they clean I it see. up. But okay. uh, anyways, on the telephone line, we can only okay. get it so good. So anyways, but we're, we're yeah. fine, Barbara. And, we're fine. Thank you, Christine, for checking in. Yeah, and and I'll, uh, Rick, I'll, I'll let you know if it, if it gets to where I can't understand it yeah, again. Well, but well, no, well, well, let us have, know. Yeah. I'll let you know. Well, yeah, we, my we, phone we, we, got, we got I have people. my sound fully up. Oh, we've got people on YouTube okay. saying sound is perfect. Sound is perfect. So, so okay. So we'll I'll see check what, it out. We'll see what happens. All right. All right. Thank so, you. anyways, we got Barbara Anderson. My goodness gracious! If you want to talk about a Watchtower researcher, if you want to talk about a Watchtower uh, person that has got loads of information, inside information, that of course would be Barbara Anderson. And Barbara, we're so glad to have you on with us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm from the old organization, not the new one, which is totally different in so many aspects. Many, many of the listeners are probably from the um, majority of them from the um, 80s and 90s, uh, or even um, the beginning of the uh, new century. And uh, so we understand one another, but I don't think the new ones who in the organization appre could appreciate the organization that we all lived with and under the domain of and the domination, I could say. Uh, isn't that so, Rick? Yeah, well, I, th I think too, Barbara, that you will agree that this is not the same organization that our grandfathers were involved with. This is a different organization. And even though, Barbara, I respect you so much as well as our audience does, you, you came out of an era when the Watchtower was at least a little palatable. It was almost like, boy, you were so proud to be one of Jehovah's Witnesses, as I was. I used to walk around like, wow, I'm so glad to be a Jehovah's Witness. That's not the case today. I wouldn't be saying that because there's so much coming out. But in your, in your era, and you knew so many good witnesses, and I want people to know as you want them to know us too, we're, we're, not, we're not picking on individual Jehovah's Witnesses. You knew many that were good people. I knew many that were good people. It's just these really arrogant bums that are controlling all of this that have hurt everybody. So what do you think about that, Bob? Well, I don't know if I call them bums, but yeah, arrogant fits. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, these, these people apparently, um, from the way that they talk, 
uh, they really, really uh, love the organization. And uh, they are really directed by the, their attorneys. Uh, in fact, that one letter I received in 1997 actually stated, uh, it was written by the Awake editor. And he said, now that we've turned all of our records and everything over to the legal department. We are not going to have as many difficulties as we had over child abuse. So they call the shots in the legal department, don't they? Well, they really do. And I mean, if there's anybody that knows more about the Watchtower, now I have to really stress to the audience that, you know, you were an insider you were right up front and close to what was going on behind the curtains. And you were able to see things that a lot of people never had privy to, including going into some of the rooms that you went into where they had files and pictures while you were working on the Proclaimers book. But, but tonight what we're going to do is we're going to go slow. We're, we're going to let the audience realize what really goes on with the higher ups in the watchtower. And tonight we're going to be talking, uh, I, I suppose you might as well start off talking about Raymond Franz. Now we know him as the man that wrote the book, The Crisis of Conscience. And many people have read that book, but there's things about Raymond that, uh, you know, maybe a lot of people aren't aware of. Now, I don't want to plaster Raymond as a bad person here tonight because I think he, I think he's helped a lot of, a lot of I think he's helped a lot of people come out of the watchtower but you know I'll tell you some of the information you sent me you sent me tons and tons of <laughs> I knew it would scare you <laughs> well I've been kind of reading through it and trying to come to grips with things but the one thing that I is the one thing that really stands out, I mean, I could go into many things here, but the one thing that really stands out to me is, you know, Ray Franz, of course, we all recognize him. He wrote the book, The Crisis of Conscience. He was a governing body member, but he was saying the main reason why he got kicked out of, or uh, thrown out of, disfellowshipped of the Watchtower was for his stance a position that he took concerning, he was trying to uh, let the Watchtower know that uh, anointed, yeah, you had to be anointed. Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses all should be anointed, not, not, just, not just you, but he uh, got in trouble for that. And he was saying his research showed, a biblical research showed that everyone had to be anointed if they really were going to be a real Jehovah's Witness. But they disagreed with him and said, nope, we're not going to go with that and threw him out. And everybody goes, if they meet the criterion for heavenly life, the, they're all going to heaven. Um, we had a very uh, a strange experience many, many years ago. Uh, the couple that married, uh, the man who married us in 1959 uh, was a uh, consultant watchtower. Um, he was marvelous, and he was the voice uh, on the Bible tapes. One of the, remember the old Bible tapes where you're reading the scriptures, uh, reading books of the Bible? Well, oh, yeah. Yeah, one of them was um, Bob Mackey, and uh, he had a beautiful uh, speaking voice. So um, he, uh, we lived in West Palm Beach, and he and his wife lived in Lake Worth, Florida. So, um, uh, he moved up, to, he and his wife eventually moved up to Tampa, Florida. I'm bringing this out because this is where it, this fundamentally happened. Uh, they were very close friends with Ray and Cynthia friends. And during the time that Ray uh, took a leave of absence from uh, Bethel, it was uh, 79, he left for two months. And uh, then they called him back when they wanted to have a meeting with him. And he had a three hour meeting with Ray. But um, in that interim, he was actually uh, preaching his new message because Bob and his wife told us that when they found out that um, Ray was uh, uh, 
was not in Bethel. He had a leave of absence. They invited him to uh, come over to uh, Tampa and see them and they'd get together again. And the first thing off that happened was that Ray started talking about the new teachings that he believed were true and that everybody who um, is uh, not a sinner, they go to heaven. Well, the Mackeys were shocked, just absolutely shocked. And we got a phone call the next day and uh, they just couldn't stop talking about it. Ray has changed so completely. Well, see, he didn't keep quiet about his beliefs. And uh, he did the same thing in um, on the other side of Florida. Uh, they had a book study somewhere around Jupiter, Florida. And uh, we had friends in, in um, went to a book study over there. Well, uh, uh, Ray and Cynthia were visiting someone on that coast and uh, they came to the book study and they, uh, Ray started talking about how he felt about these things there. So um, word was getting up to headquarters and within that two months that he was, uh, had his leave, he was called in and and he had I th i'm pretty sure it was a three-hour meeting and they told him that he uh, was teaching uh, different teachings and that was uh, not appreciated and they could, and he said well if you want to believe differently um you can they didn't hold that against them everyone has the right to believe differently but when you're discussing this and pushing your beliefs well they couldn't countenance that so uh, that's when they told him that uh, he, he was asked to resign, which he did. And then, of course, uh, as you all know from reading Crisis of Conscience, uh, they changed their kind of policies there that uh, you can, as, as um, Gregerson did, the man who uh, Ray went to work for in Alabama, um, he had disassociated himself, and so when Ray and he were eating together, that was panic, uh, really tantamount to uh, disassociation. So that was the new thing in 1980, disassociation. So I was reviewing uh, a year or so ago, I reread Crisis of Conscience, and um, I really appreciated it. And, and I think that uh, no one could tell the kind of things that Ray told about the operation of the headquarters. Um, I certainly uh, didn't uh, see anything like what he did, good or bad. I mean, uh, he certainly was at the top echelon and um, it was, it's an excellent book. Uh, Peter Gregerson did tell us though that, um, that Ray didn't want to write it but uh, he, he uh, was really pushed into it. And like I said, he said, you can't work for me. I think I got this right. So if he's listening, don't scold me. But uh, if you want to work, continue to work for me, you got to write. Because he said that they used to walk around the lake in the evening and Ray would tell Peter all kinds of experiences. And Peter said, everybody should know these things. And so uh, he said, I'm, I'm telling you, you've got to write this down. And, and it, it, it was a, a very well done book, except that there are things in that book that are Ray's uh, viewpoints. Uh, and we all have them. Uh, from what Ray experienced, of course, he, he, come, he came at this from a different direction than most of us, because we didn't see what he saw. And not all the government bodies were bad. Uh, it's making a real... All right, Papa, we're going we're gonna to hold on right here for a second. We're just going to have some issues here with sound. Yeah. Uh, we are, uh, it's not, I mean, I can hear you and it's fine. We're going to get, but I, I'm going to be sending you a microphone the next week and I'll work you through on how to set it up and what have you. But, but, it, but in the meantime, uh, my microphone uh, is on the log tech uh, thing I, that you add to the. Are you, are, you close, are you close to your microphone? 
Oh, I'm pretty close. I'll be chewing on it in a minute. It's attached to the top of the. All right. Well, it's there, so it's okay. So let, let's just keep it right where it is. But uh, let's just go back here to Ray Franz. Okay. Uh, obviously, the, the the book Crisis of Conscience has helped so many people uh, come out of the Watchtower, and Ray has been so instrumental. But Ray did have some finicky ways about him. I know we tried to get him on the six screens years ago, say 15 years ago. He was a friend of our uh, friend Richard Rawi, who isn't with us anymore. But we did try to get Ray on. But Ray was very concerned. Uh, Ray, Ray wrote some information in Watchtower Publications that he wasn't proud of. And he was afraid that some of the listeners coming in on the six screens or some of the callers would kind of call him out on it. Uh, for example, Ray was involved in the bedroom laws. He, uh, he was kind of instrumental in, from what I understand, putting that all together to some degree. And he was afraid that, you know, he's hurt so many people that he'd have a hard time defending himself on that. And I'm not picking on Ray. I mean, really, Ray has helped so many people. No, this is not an attack on Ray France. He was a very moral and ethical man. And right. he really had uh, strong uh, uh, religious beliefs. And, and so but what this is, is a commentary or a, a chronicle that I have put together on uh, that one size doesn't fit all. And, and this is what has happened in many, many religions. Uh, people come up with ideas and beliefs and uh, other people are attracted to it. And then after a while, they find that uh, that's not what they want and they can't get out of the, what they agreed to when they were when in their religion. Um, the, the point is that um, you make a decision for a belief, and for some people, it's just exactly what they want. Others, like the bedroom laws, it doesn't fit. And you're in the religion, and you are stuck. Because, see, the major teachings of Jehovah's Witnesses are what attracted me. There wasn't a hellfire, a trinity, or an immortal soul. But all the other things are like in the Catholic Church. They have major doctrines, but they also have what Jehovah's Witnesses have and the Mormons have, Scientologists have. They have all these practices and policies, and those become even more important than the major beliefs, especially in, in Christianity where the majority of Christians, they, they accept those three major teachings and so that's not really why they go to church. They go to church because it's, uh, you feel close to a deity and for other reasons, or they want to uh, repent of their sins maybe. But generally speaking, uh, with the witnesses, you get this fellowship mainly for all the other things um, and you get, uh, shunned, and the shunning is a policy, it's a practice that the witnesses slowly moved into, and they, what they have today is a, an extraordinary uh, human rights uh, problem now for them. But um, uh, Ray is responsible for the same as what many of the leaders of Job's Witnesses through the years uh, did. And that is that they, they practiced at the fundamental level. A, um, they wanted to understand the Bible. So there's two things that you take into consideration that many people are familiar with, but let's review them. There is such a thing as exergesis, and eisergesis. These are, are terms in theology, basically to do with understanding the Bible. And uh, what it is, is um, they ref this reflects whether you consider the original context of scripture to understand scripture, or you bring your own meaning. Eisergesis is bringing your own meaning to scripture, regardless of what it meant to its original audience 
author or audience. So uh, you have your belief and then you try to find the scripture. Well, many of Jehovah's Witnesses leaders did that over the years. And it sounded so good. And you thought this is what everyone should believe in. Never really thinking the thing through and that what it could cause. And what in Ray's case it caused was something so awful. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Because if he was alive and knew, uh, he would, I think he would be shocked. But on the other hand, he wanted to bring the watchtower down. Uh, and this is just about done it. Because um, Ray uh, coming up with an idea, didn't follow through with the, his research. And that was unusual because he was a very good researcher. In, in um, Crisis of Conscience in the beginning, he talks about that. He talks about using commentaries and, and how even though the rest of them didn't like commentaries, the governing bodies frowned at commentaries. He, he really felt that there were wonderful commentaries. This is practically a whole chapter on it. And, uh, and yet, in, in uh, a situation uh, regarding a scripture, he did not follow through. And what he caused is what we have today, is the, is the, re the results of not reporting crime to the authorities. All right, well, let's stop right, let's stop right there for a second. Barbara, just to reiterate what's going on here. We've got Barbara Anderson coming in, and she's talking about what's going on behind the curtains of the Watchtower. Well, we're talking about Raymond Franz. Well, we know that he was a... Uh, we, we know that he was a governing body member. He wrote the book, Crisis of Conscience. But, but Barbara, the, the way that I really even feel about Raymond is he had mixed emotions. Uh, you know, he was a witness. He was a governing body member. He loved the Watchtower to some degree, as, as most, most of us did when we were witnesses. And when you come out, you're kind of shocked that, these guys really pulled the hat over your eyes, so to speak. But Ray, I always noticed that he kind of went softly, even in the book Crisis of Conscience. In the other book, he has Freedom from uh, Christian Religion. I, I forget how the, 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 the title was, but uh, Freedom in Christian Religion or whatever it was. But he, he did comment about the fact that you know, he he had a soft spot for the watchtower. He always did. But, uh, you know, he's very hard to really come down big time on it. Do you get the same feelings? Well, yeah. Well, see, uh, when you're very involved with the watchtower, you, your expectations, they have standards. There's a, uh, the writing department has a book on the standards for the writing department. And they have standards for the, the service department, standards for the art department. Well, their standards change with the times. And uh, many years ago, when they started under Rutherford, basically putting those standards together, uh, the... Um, the standards, it depended upon the leader, like Rutherford. He came at the religion differently than Russell. Russell came at it from, a, he was more of a, a, a white-collar man, uh, you know, educated group. But the blue-collar followers, uh, that was Rutherford's group, labor. He even had a, a, a paper that was called uh, something to do with labor. It was a large newspaper. They used to give it out. I saw it at headquarters, and most people don't even know it, it existed. And the blue collar works, that's what it was meant for. So it looked like uh, during the Depression, it was very popular. They give it away. Uh, so the different uh, culture changes were reflected in the organization. And Ray grew up under the uh, a, a different culture than, of course, uh, than um, later people, than the, the, many of the uh, younger governing body even today. But since most of them are pretty up in age, uh, they uh, kind of operated under that uh, culture that uh, Ray did. And um, 
you know, he was born, I, put, I made some notes here, and he was born in 1922, and uh, he was uh, in, uh, baptized in 1939. His uh, father became a Bible student uh, much earlier. So he went to Gilead in 1944. Uh, he was in the Caribbean as a uh, working um, as like a circuit overseer, that type of thing. Uh, and in 19, uh, he married in 1937. Um, he was at the world headquarters 15 years, but he went in there in uh, 1965. And uh, he, you know, that, I, of course, <laughs> this is a, he was much older than me, but um, the, the, uh, you expected certain things. And so even the, back then, the speakers at the assemblies, the speakers at your kingdom hall, they had a standard. Uh, you could, you how a professional they sounded and how watchtowery they sounded, then you re, it reflected maturity. And uh, once in a while, you get a circuit horse here that was a character, and he would be a little different than others. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, that more and more the organization was had types, and uh, these certain types were were uh, elevated. And uh, it wasn't your what you knew as a um, your a. a a profession that was important to Watchtower. It was what they called a spiritual man. So Ray hung around with what they considered as spiritual men. And Joe and us, as I married a ex Bethel, well, he was in Bethel when we got engaged. I hung with those people too. And you expected a certain behavior, a certain way they talked about the organization, no riffraff, right? And um, it was uh, very pleasant. You knew what to expect in life. And um, it was many people thoroughly enjoyed being uh, in that upper echelon of the uh, Watchtower organization. And I'm sure all the organizations have a similar uh, behavior on part of their uh, people who run, the, run or their organization. Um, but eventually with Ray, he began to butt heads and he concluded that the teachings were a myth. But he was hearing things and reading things. So in 1980, he said that the teachings were a myth, persistent, pervasive, and unrealistic. But yet, I'll tell you, he contributed to all three. And uh, he didn't realize he, he did, but he did. And so uh, by 1980, he ha had already read, uh, I believe it was 78, that Karloff, it's Karl Olaf Johnson had sent his manuscript about 1914. I have his book and I like, I know I have it, but I couldn't locate it this evening. Otherwise, I'm talking about, I can't even remember the title. But I read it, and it was all about disproving the date 1914. Uh, well, that book in 78, to the first 20 chapters, went to all the governing body members, and uh, they, including Ray. And uh, he thoroughly disapproved that the date 1914, the way the Watchtower viewed it. But Ray, still, he supported it, supported the organization until he didn't support the organization. But there was a lots of psychological things here too that were at force because Ray was different than the other, uh, in many ways, he was different. He used the Bible. Everything you have to have an answer from the Bible. And in many cases, his was the practice of eisegesis, where he found the scriptures, even though he condemns that doing that, he did that same thing. Because he talks about the aid book and what Nor expected of the aid book and how we have to stick to the scriptures. But we have instances of where Ray did not uh, let the, let the uh, original author of the scripture 
and context speak for it, but he had his opinions and found scriptures to fit that. Uh, but he wasn't alone. And the writers of the Watchtower, as far as I'm concerned, being in the writing department, and I was, I, I'm sure I did the same thing at one time, but you, you, um, we all uh, had an elevated viewpoint of the organization. Our standard book made you write the way they wanted you to write. And in the editing department, they would, uh, they wouldn't allow anything to go through that had any negativism. And uh, so it, we all reflected what, what we, our dream. And so we had a few scriptures on a paradise earth and, and the magazines elaborated. The writers elaborated on everything to make the dream look like it. You could reach out and touch it. And, and uh, if you had a problem, like Ray had a problem with um, the issues of, of um, wrongdoing in the organization and what you do about wrongdoing. So you have books that he was uh, involved with that reflect his opinion on keeping the organization clean. So I can go into that in a minute. And so is there something else that you want to ask? Yeah, well, it's, uh, well, the great Barbara, we're talking about Ray Franz now. I'm certainly not trying to beat up on Ray Franz. He was, I mean, he's helped so many witnesses leave the organization. I mean, a governing body member that said, that's it, I've had enough. But I mean, he was picked up for, you know, having feelings that were anti Watchtower. But what I did want to talk about at this point is, now, Ray Franz, how, how did he really feel about women in the organization? Uh, did he, uh, well, did he, yeah, let me, let me hear about that, Barbara. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Cynthia was absolutely the opposite of him. Now, in, in um, Crisis of Conscience, he said that he married because that was the, it was uh, the right thing to do. He said, how do they expect, he criticized the organization. How do they expect, uh, men to um, uh, not commit morality and, and that you know they can't marry because back then the that was a, a something you didn't do remember i talked last week on nor and he was single until his um later years when they need when they needed companions or they wanted companions that but in the blue youth they didn't marry but I think, uh, well, Ray was 37 when he married Cynthia, and she was absolutely so different, which opposites attract, so I know that, but uh, she, she was just as earthy as could be, opposite of his aloofness, I think that's the way you would say it, and uh, uh, he, he would always have that tight lip upper personality, you know, as if he, he knew all the secrets. He was nice. I've been into his home. But when um, Cynthia and others, and we were laughing over different things, to him, that wasn't, it wouldn't, it wasn't anything that we were uh, saying that was out of place. But uh, he would just get up and go into another room. Uh, he didn't uh, appreciate women who talked about spiritual things. It was very obvious um, because there was a number of times we were with them and uh, there were women there. And, and some of the people that took care of the Franzes where they li lived outside of Atlanta and their way up when they were way up in age, who lived pretty close to them, they definitely uh, were c close friends. And, and the women were the ones that helped keep the Franzes going. And... Um, always looked after him. Well, Ray was fine with that, but you didn't cross over into spiritual things. And that's the way some of the men were at Bethel in the writing department, service department, but others weren't like that at all. But uh, Ray, Ray was. And uh, he was aloof when you started, when I started asking him questions. And uh, he did talk in Crisis of Conscience about uh, finances. And he was very straightforward in the, in the, 
book about uh, that none of the governing body knew anything about uh, finances. Nobody would tell them anything. Well, I asked him. I was sitting next to him at dinner, and everybody was uh, in the, in the um, at the dinner table. Had got it was about ten people or so. I don't know, and they were in the living room. But I was a slow eater, and uh, always was. And so uh, he was on his dessert, ready to get up. And I just turned to him and asked him because I, I was uh, in accounting and bookkeeping for years. So I asked her if they had, uh, if the governing body got a balance sheet every month and uh, whatever. And he said no. And then he got up and walked. He wouldn't discuss it with me. Also, I could, before I met Ray, uh, I was starting my research on um, the Russells. And this was at, just after I left the organization and I had done so much research at headquarters on the Russells. So I wanted to continue. And uh, I called Ray. I was attending a writer's conference in South Carolina. And I thought uh, they were very interested in what I was writing. And I, was, I uh, had uh, explained and I wrote up an introduction to what I was doing for a book. And uh, there was an agency that was interested. So when I got home here to Tennessee, I called Ray. And that was, I introduced myself to him and what I was doing. And I talked a bit about um, the Russells. He was absolutely not interested in me talking to him about the Russells. And he considered himself an expert on them. And, and that's the way it was. I had a good sense of humor. But uh, when I gave him all the material that went to the rest of the governing body when I was at Bethel on child abuse that I had prepared for the governing body. Well, hold, 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 well, hold on one second now, Barbara. Let's just stop you. Let's go slow. Well, why, why did Ray not like you talking about Russell? I have no idea. Um, I'll tell you, when I first started, well, these men... Uh, were superior, you know, they were the insiders, they thought they knew everything. I, I absolutely loved Jim Penton. Jim Penton and 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 um, his wife, his, uh, his wife, who's the one who's deceased, we were very, very, very good friends. But the first time I talked to him about the Russells, he did not uh, appreciate because he had put years together, years of working uh, on material and putting together in their books on the subject. And here I am, this woman who they never knew before comes along and, and, and I'm saying, I, I got stuff you've never seen. And I start telling them, well, I can understand that they didn't, I was too much for him, I think. And so uh, now Jim, he thought it over, and uh, and he, when he heard the whole story of on one subject to do with the Russells, he he said, "Oh, I never knew that. I never knew that. That makes it ch a completely different picture on that." But not uh, not Ray. Ray would not do that. He wouldn't. Uh, it's just it's just the generation uh, uh, that he grew up in maybe, but yet others like Arthur Worsley was of his same generation and Arthur Worsley was a hoot and he loved hearing all this stuff. And we, it, 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 you know, I gotta tell you, you know, Ray came from uh, his roots of the same roots as Freddie Franz. And um, Freddie was different, that's for sure. And uh, uniquely different. So, uh, uh, so, you know, there was this, this commonality of the, that they had where they were the oracles and who we were the underlings. Well, no, 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 I mean, no, no doubt. I mean, people put all their faith in it. But Barbara, the thing is, I mean, you, you've, you've got some inside information. You work at the Watchtower. You were there at the world headquarters. You worked on the Proclaimers book. You had privy. You had privy to certain rooms. There were files, there were documents, there were pictures uh, of yesteryear in the Watchtower. So, I mean, would you like to share some of the thoughts that you 
came across or some of the files and documents and pictures that you came across while you were working there? I mean, not everybody had privy to these rooms, but where you're working on the proclaimers books, they they gave you that privy. But what what can well, you tell, can you you know, tell us some of the things? Go ahead, tell us some of the things that you saw in the research in these rooms when you're doing research. Um well, I did have the approval of uh, the writing department, of course, the three governing body members that ran the department. And um, so w with the approval of working on the Proclaimers book uh, and going and looking for new information, uh, they couldn't really be restrictions because how could you find anything new if you got to do it the old way? And uh, I guess uh, I don't know why that um, uh, they they uh, permitted me to have so much leeway, and uh, but they did, and so uh, of course my the most important find was going into the um, uh, treasury department, and I think I talked about that before, and and finding the minutes I found the the account book which showed that the president i told before was uh conley and not but that was the president of the association in 1981 um, not the 1884 uh legal corporation of zions washer so uh, uh but there were things inside there nobody had looked at probably in 50 years and and you know, the, uh, unless you had a reason there to look, you didn't do, you didn't look in things. It's a very, a very uh, closed organization. People didn't talk about what they did. If you, in the writing department, you didn't go around asking people, what are you working on? Or they were saying, oh, I'm doing such and such. It, it, it just wasn't that way. And so uh, he, I had permission. So here I go into this huge vault and walk in there and there are all these file cabinets and I'm allowed to go through all those file cabinets. But what really struck me was the minutes. And that was, uh, that was up high uh, above us, some of the other file cabinets and were all these books, account books. And um, there, when I took them down one by one, opened them up, there were the minutes of the corporate meetings from the very first one in um, 1884. And uh, it, was, it was extraordinary what was in there. And I happened to, I did not get them there. By the way, even though I had my hands on extraordinary material, I never took any of it, never made a copy for myself because I just it was, I felt that it, uh, that wasn't the way to do things. It just wasn't, um, I don't know, it, it was just the kind of person that I am, not better or worse than anybody else. I just had such respect for the organization and I was there for a, per, a certain purpose. So I just took well, my. You, you, wouldn't, you, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't take a copy of it. And I can yeah. understand that sometimes you're saying, well, you know, I don't want to share this, but I but mean, I, I mean, the pictures that I had that in, had my hands of Rutherford and I mentioned that before, you know, you, I, everybody who saw those pictures, which was like three people that um, had to see them and before they were put away in uh, the art department, you knew this, he was drunk. So uh, well, what, what, well, let's slow down here. So you saw pictures of Rutherford. Yeah. And, and, and um, what, 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 what were these? You know, they're all pictures that were put away. So what did you see uh, concerning Rutherford? What, what, what well, struck you? He, uh, he was in, uh, uh, I, I, I believe we talked about this a week or two ago. Anyway, he was in a one-piece bathing suit from the back in those years. The men wore those. And uh, he had a huge belly. And um, and he was just very playful, and he stuck his tongue into the camera lens uh, from uh, like six inches away, 
and uh, he was, uh, uh, he, you know, you knew he was drinking. There was a, the way he was uh, um, um, laying on the chaise and whatever. And uh, anyway, so I got those. I had the, I had a lot of private material that uh, were was just discarded in desks, and and I was go through all that stuff. Uh, but the, the um, there was uh, things that I can't even remember anymore. I just took them and gave them to Carla. Well, just uh, just what you did say, though. I mean, uh, Rutherford in a bathing suit. Uh, <laughs> what what uh, what what do you extract from a picture like that? Why why would the president of the Watchtower want himself be shown in a bathing suit? I mean, do you have any feelings on that? Not, not really. He had a right to have a, a relaxing life, uh, but it was that it was that he 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 was silly looking. He was uh, uh, it wasn't uh, like the president of an organization would look. I mean, he looked like he was slovenly, and there was a swimming pool, nobody there, and it was above a, like a, on a roof of a, a big building. And in the distance, you could see the ocean. Um, so it was on his vacation. And, uh, you know, he was just being foolish. And he has a right to be foolish. But that's the kind of pictures I saw, plus a, a number of other ones. Of, I really had thousands of pictures. And, in fact, uh, I worked with Audrey Norris making a thesaurus of, of all the thousands of pictures they had that they didn't even know what they were. We had to look all through them and Audrey was trying to identify people that she had met over the years. And it was just a human, very human organization. And um, so you saw them in their, their best. I, some of our neighbors were at, in the towers were uh, uh, very important people. When they relaxed, they were relaxed, you know, and you saw them in all, always. Well, well, this this is very good. In other words, because the because the watch it because the watch that was so secretive and so esoteric, and you know, people can't get enough of seeing what's going on behind the curtains. Uh, you had privy. You you were able to go into rooms that people could not go into. These were rooms that. Now, you were given privy because of being writing on the Proclaimers book. But, I mean, who would walk into these rooms? They were filled with watchtower files and documents and pictures. Who Who's going in there? I mean, besides... Uh, well, the, the vault. The vault was where they kept money and their counting books. But, but there was a storehouse for a uh, hundred years' worth of uh, material from Russell's day. And uh, they have to go somewhere with it. So it was in this huge, huge vault on the top floor of the 30, uh, 2530 building. And, uh, well, it was actually the 25, where the lobby is and you, the top floor. And uh, so nobody goes in there. And if you're caught in there, even if you worked in, in the department, you shouldn't be in there. But I had a right to be in there because I was looking for the past. And uh, I found a lot for the past, a lot of in the book, the Proclaimers book. That if you look through, I looked through the pages after it came out and I saw, well, that's, I found that or I found this. A lot of things miscellaneous that others uh, had, um, wouldn't think much of it. Uh, some of the experiences that are in the Proclaimers that came out of the, um, uh, uh, some of the, the vault and going through the files and you're seeing experiences from different countries and uh, but this a long time ago now but what i did that was so um revealing to me was when i took a second look at the interpretation of the doctrines of jehovah's witnesses specifically not hellfire and all of that but I took a look at what made them different than all the other religions and realized where this came from. And so like Ray, he believed what I believed in, that the world belonged to Satan and devil, right? We all believed that. And um, he, he, he believed that the world was governed by unseen wicked spirits. 
that directed all of uh, our systems in the world, including the judicial system. So then he would reason, like Jehovah's Witnesses continue to do, that why do, go, why do you go to Satan's world for help or, or to um, seek out help um, when it belongs to Satan? But yet we went to the Supreme Court to be able to go to the to uh, preach and to have freedom of speech and freedom of religion went to the Supreme Court and won these 47 cases. But, um, you know, the elders, it was thought, sit in judgment over the organization and they're placed in their position by Holy Spirit. So everything uh, is colored by that belief when you, you have um, issues uh, with the surrounding world and you're an exceptionally different group. And uh, I don't believe that Ray purposely sought to impose a particular meaning or his belief on uh, any particular thing that he came up with. I mean, he wanted to have the truth of the matter and he sort of invented things like the governing body arrangement. Yeah. Which there was no uh, there was no uh, governing body arrangement in Jerusalem. All of that has been disbunked. Ray did a great job of disbunking that in in his book. And uh, uh, I I mean um, the he he came up with the governing body. And uh, that has been disbunked. And I think he, he kind of talks about that in, in his book. Yeah, um, he does. And in fact, probably he does. But, you know, the good, the good thing about that is at least he recognized it. And he was yeah. a governing body member. But what I want to do now, I want to switch gears a little bit. Well, let's get, let's get into some thoughts here. You know, in talking with you, you and I talked during the week and discussed certain things. But what, what comes to my attention is we have a lot of people higher up in the watchtower. These, these are the watchtower officials. Now, do you think that all of the watchtower officials, including governing body members, do you really think they know this is the truth or are they just leading us down a dead road? Well, uh, somebody asked us me that question. In fact, it was yesterday. And it wasn't you, it was someone who called me and we were talking about something else, but it got to that. And, you know, you can't impose your opinions on, uh, I mean, my beliefs about what they believe in the whole water. But, uh, but they are truly organizational men. And they looked at it from always that uh, plateau. Well, Ray didn't. Ray looked at the if from the Bible's point of view and, um, and his point of view. Uh, 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 these men, I don't know these guys today, but I do know things about them, which uh, makes me reflect that uh, I would like them as much as I liked uh, Swingle, for instance, or um, they were more earthy people. Uh, so was um, Souter was, and Souter was a very difficult, cold man. They were, of, you know, at one point there were 18 governing body members and uh, all from different walks of life and uh, different opinions. It's a wonder they did as well as they did when they came together as a governing body. But eventually, you know, uh, they were into putting together a, organization and they moved away from the biblical area they left that to their writing department and writing had to come up with uh, ideas uh, when things fell through uh, they had to overcome it now, I can give you an example of, of one of them but at this point your question is about these individuals and uh, they want to salvage this organization as much as Scientology wants to salvage theirs and the Mormons want theirs. Belief is a funny thing. Uh, uh, it's a hard thing to talk about because 
uh, what's my belief in something is it, not necessarily yours, depending upon so many things, so many areas in life. And that's why, uh, as I said, one size doesn't fit all. And that's why this organization has had so many come in and go out, come in and go out the great revolving door over the years, as I call it. And it, it, it doesn't uh, fit. And so they come up with something else to fit and they call it new light. And, um, and we all understand that stuff. It's a way to keep, uh, keep people interested, keep going, but they're running out of interesting things. And, um, uh, I said, I haven't been witness in a long time. I don't know what holds people into it, except if they're old, they're going to just die in it. And, uh, the younger ones don't know the religion we know, we knew, um, you know, uh, I, I know that everybody identifies me with, um, child abuse. It really, I am a, more of a historian than, uh, anyone could imagine. I have uh, written many, many things about the history and, um, uh, I'll give you an example. No, I'll, I'll get off the subject because I don't know how to really answer the, what you asked. You know, uh, it's almost like that the, to the leaders of the Watchtower that the Bible is a, a big lump of Play-Doh and you mold it around the Watchtower's teachings. Isn't that a wonderful way to put it? And uh, they all do it. They all do it from Russell's time onward. Uh, that uh, there's a scripture, maybe the scripture, uh, I think it's Matthew 22. Anyway, uh, remember the, the question was, uh, how many, um, uh, uh, the, the woman was married to someone and he died and he had brothers. And so she became the wife of, I think, seven men. They all died. So in the resurrection, who, who was, uh, which, which of the seven was going to be her husband? Well, the washer made comments on that from the beginning. I have comments on it that Russell made all the way down to the, when it finally came up when I was in the writing department, there was a talk at the big assemblies in, I think it was 90, 91. And, um, and the, the, the talk was about um, the scripture and what was the meaning of this scripture. And so single women wanted to stay single and pioneer and marry in the new world. And in that talk, they talked differently about the fulfillment of that scripture. And what it did is it caused many, many letters coming into headquarters uh, to, from women who were pioneering who said, they were gonna stop pioneering, they're gonna get married now because the majority of men who, well, all men who would die before Armageddon uh, would not marry in, and they'd be like the angels. Because at that time, that the fulfillment of that was thought to be on the paradise earth. And yet there are other places in the, in the literature where they thought the opposite is only to the heavenly class. There was so many, many interpretations and I had to go through everything, located pages and pages of com uh, uh, thoughts on the scripture and presented them to uh, some of the writers. And uh, because so many pioneers were leaving it to get married because they were so afraid that in the new world they wouldn't have they made nobody to marry. And so they, so that was a big alarm at headquarters. And uh, so they had to send a, two writers sent the letter up to the teaching committee. It took them six months to decide that they were never going to comment on that scripture again. And they never have because there's no answer. But that was honest. They were honest about that. But there's so many times they're not honest about it. They try to make their interpretation fit the scripture and then change and change but sometimes the way that they do it causes so much damage and, uh, it's it's just it's just the way it is with religion and and trying to seek out the answers uh that aren't there in the bible and um so you know this is just, just well 
Well, Bob, what we're going to do here, what, what, what we got to do, I got I to rein you in. I mean, you have so much knowledge. I, I want to keep this in a forum that, you know, I want people to be able to really identify with what you're saying. And I, I know that you have so much information that you want to share with us. So I'm going to ask you the questions and let, let, let's, work, let, let's work together, okay, okay, so that you can cut to first, the chase. And all first of all, I, I want to say this. I, as you know, I like to have the facts. There's a lots of times you can't find facts. And you, and you, so you put a lot of information together and you think you, you understand it. But anyway, you know, it comes out of facts is truth. And um, it's not the other way around. Yeah. And then, and then what comes from that comes trust. Yeah. And so I will, I want people to understand that that's what we're, we're here for. All right. Um, well, what, what, okay. I, what, I want, what I want people to do now, I want people, we want to zero in. You have a wealth of information. And I don't want to overload everyone's donkey with this. What we want to do is I, I, I want you to be able to connect as you are. I mean, but I want them really to see what you know. You, you have been involved with the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions. And then soon we'll open up the lines as well. But Barbara, I have to say to you, uh, your, of all of your dealings in the Watchtower, all, all of your connections, all of your past experiences with this organization, what, what, what do you want to tell the people on this program tonight? What do you want to tell them about the Watchtower? I don't know. I, that's a... There's no simple way to put it. You know, it doesn't fit me. It stopped fitting me a long time ago, uh, not over doctrine, but over a policy. And uh, it, the Catholic Church wouldn't fit me now. It wouldn't fit me for many, many years because over do a doctrine. How they handled their members, what they did to as a loving, uh, which God is love. And so they should reflect that and how they dealt with their members. And that is where my, uh, the shackles on my back <laughs> were raised up over the cruelty that this organization reflected to its men in control uh, over the other members and uh, the unfairness and to to um, exalt the organization above the members. The members kept are the organization and uh, they should have been treated with love and decency. And so many haven't been by the men who were put in prominent places and positions. Now that's a difficult um, order because everybody's got negatives attached to their personality, assets and deficits. And, uh, but yet, the, even Ray didn't listen. He, he came up with ideas that were not helpful to the flock. He thought they were, and so he wasn't alone. Too many of them over the years did the same thing, and it was disastrous upon the upon the flock. I think, like I read about Scientology, and they are the same thing. To survive, uh, they will, uh, they'd sell their mother up the river, I'd swear. Jehovah's Witnesses is the same way. Don't interfere with the operation. That's where they're, I've never seen anything like it. You could, you could uh, be uh, having a wonderful conversation with a someone in the organization who is, has a very high position. And uh, you just cross a boundary that they feel uh, that you don't belong in, uh, you get the look or the, uh, you, you lose your position even. Men have lost their position. So, uh, because they were, uh, they, uh, they, stepped, they stepped out of their place. And that's not the, what the, 
the scriptures that um I mean, the scriptures, there's millions and millions of opinions in the scriptures, because look how old the thing is. And uh, but basically, we live by a few of those uh, scriptures, and so does all of uh, Christianity. They quote those same scriptures about kindness and love, and uh, push comes to shove. They, they, uh, there is no love when it comes to protecting the organization so what are you protecting you're protecting people at the highest level and legality that's what ray learned he learned they would became legalistic and and he couldn't he couldn't that and many other things it's all outlined of course i'm not going to repeat the entire um i don't know how to do that anyway uh crisis of conscience but it's plenty um clear in there and um uh but his situation i go back to him because he reflects what others have done that john wischuk was another one Pri oh, Pri well, let's, let's hold, hold on one second Let, let's not let's not go on to anything else no let's just stay with you would talk because sometimes I'm, 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 just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm trying to corral you in here all right let's just stay with the subject of hand we were talking about ray franz yeah. now I, I just want you to tell me one way or the other. Do you think Ray Franz helped the people that were getting out of the watchtower? Do you think he helped in his endeavors doing that? Well, absolutely. He 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 picked up the um, or or opened the curtain of the watchtower through his books. The inner operations. He showed their um, annoyances. He showed their a duplicity he showed uh, on different people. I mean, they were, they're all so different. Uh, I saw Klein in a different way than somebody who knew Klein when he was young. And I saw him as an old man who was nothing but an alcoholic and a grump. And uh, I didn't imagine it. it. We all knew what was going on. And uh, so uh, all of these individuals made up a body. And they had to, also they couldn't, they didn't operate alone. They had to have the uh, legal department involved in things. They had to have uh, perhaps um, uh, some decision had to be made. It wasn't just the governing body. It was perhaps, it was this teaching committee that had to be involved in, in things. It was very complex. The organization was so simple. It was very, very complex. And how can you discuss that in an hour and a half? Well, it's very, it's very hard to do that, but here's, here's, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we do have a lot of people calling in tonight. So let's just bring some people on. Let's let them yeah, but, but let me tell you, and so I can be finished with this. Go and ahead. that was, let me tell you that what, what this whole issue is about Ray, because it affects everyone in Jehovah's Witnesses organization since it started. And uh, that was Ray who uh, was uh, in, in a um, writing and he was working on the lamp book. And I think that was 67. And, um, and he, he discovered a scripture, and I have this on my website, but it's very important that people understand this. And I call the article, Flawed Decree Conceals Criminals. And that's what's brought the Watchtower to its position just today. Uh, I know what I know about the kind of money that they're paying out. And it's all because of this situation with Ray taking a scripture, Leviticus 5.1, and taking it out of context and using it to tell everybody, and it was a, the lamp book was the first time that they put that in there, that um, you have to uh, testify. When you see someone, a brother, commit a sin, you, uh, you need to testify of it. And... Um, the scripture in different translations comes out differently, uh, the wording of it. And so I'm just breaking it down. On, on my website, look it up. 
plug it in. F flawed decree conceals criminals. And uh, Ray uh, introduced it, I said, in that. And he also puts it five times in the aid book, which, of course, he was the one who was the uh, compiler or director of that, nor put him in charge of that. And there were five all together that worked on that. Oh, there were others, but I mean, they were the heads of different parts of it. And then, um, then we got we get to the organization book, which was seventy two. Five years later, uh, in in the organization book, there's Ray's words, and it's actually I'll tell you, I have the um, I have the uh, crisis of conscience. And on the footnote on page 79, is that he, he says the three uh, chapters that he wrote in uh, the, um, that organization book. And um, he, he was assigned chapters on your service to God, safeguarding the clean, cleanness of the congregation and endurance that results in divine approval. It was in there that he introduced the very same chapter he had in the light book on Leviticus and uh, to testify. And basically all it was is if you see your brother committing any uh, sin, then but in in ex, um, in um, uh, organization book, he introduced the word crime. And he said, like in Israel, uh, crime, you have to go to the authorities and now see, Initially, it was go to the authorities, and in Leviticus, that was the whole idea. And it was um, uh, chapter four and chapter five were uh, not um, like many people think they were. It wasn't. It was wrongdoing. You testify, but it was not planned wrongdoing. It was unintentional. The fourth and fifth chapter are unintentional sin, and how do you get God to forgive you for it? And so then you. Uh, you, you made a sacrifice. So what was the degree of the sacrifice? Big, small, whatever. So he uses this one on the testifying, and uh, but it didn't mean what he thought it meant. And uh, this was after the courts found out about the wrongdoing and then put out the word to the town and said, tell us what you know. The way Ray took it was, uh, if you see your brother doing something wrong, and you go right to the elders. You do not go to the authorities. And if it's crime, that's what you do. Ray put his inter interpretation on this. It started showing up more and more and more in the literature. And uh, you had an entire article in an in an Awake magazine that even the um, uh, Los Angeles um, L.A. Uh, newspaper picked it up because it was so outstanding. I did a tremendous amount of research here, proved it from inside and out what this did to Jehovah's Witnesses organization. And, uh, and it is reflected even to this day because they are paying out millions and millions of dollars. And do not think that I don't know what I'm talking about because I do. And you know what? I found out recently, I'm enemy number one because they know what I'm saying is true. So they're changing their direction. It's going to be very interesting to watch. Well, it could be changing the direction, Barbara, but let's do this. My goodness, thank you for spilling the beans, but let, let's open up the lines. Uh, who would like to say hello to Barbara Anderson? My goodness gracious, we got a lot of people on our telephone line. We only got a few minutes left. If you'd like to say hello to Barbara, my goodness, now would be the time to come in. Now would be the time to speak up and say hello. I mean, why don't you ask Barbara a question? Uh, she's been involved with the Watchtower for many years. She was in it. She was there as an insider in the Watchtower. So maybe we'll get someone to ask a question. But, Bob, I'll ask you a question myself. Uh, it's uh, you, You've got to feel a little odd. I mean, being involved with the Watchtower, being involved with them for as many years as you were, you and your husband, Joe, uh, it's got to be, you know, you lay in bed at night, it's going to be very distressing. It's going to be very distressing for you to say, geez, I was involved in all of this and it, it's making me sick the more I'm finding out about it. So how do you really personally feel after you left the watchtower? You know, it's been a long time ago, but the, the way I feel is 
this, you know, um, you by their fruits, you will know them. The fruitage of the watchtower is what we're seeing. That's the thing. The fruitage is awful. And that's why they have uh, the membership is uh, just, you know yourself, you've said it. How many are leaving constantly? You're hearing from them. I'm hearing from them. Uh, they've had it. The fruitage is awful. So it's the results. So I know that uh, what I have said and done over these years has exposed uh, what they have, their mistakes. And, uh, and they did it. Uh, some of them did it uh, because they were in their own world. They invented a religion, so to speak. And the closer and the more you look at their history and the more you talk about old timers, I could go on and talk to you about Malawi. You know what Ray says in his book about all of that. Malawi, Mexico, all the, uh, uh, the policies that they had that were 100% wrong. Uh, they made it up as they were going, and they didn't look into it enough to find out they were in such error. Some of the things they did were out and out lies. So, uh, well, I'm not sure that phone so, line coming in from, but uh, that was my phone. I stopped it. So, okay, that's, that's fine. So, uh, you know, I, I'm pleased that. Um, I could help others get free of this. But on the other hand, uh, we were responsible for the results. The results of our, of our own uh, a son being a, a devout uh, witness. Uh, so, you know, in Europe today, in, in many countries in Europe, you, you all are going to find out more and more about this. And this human rights issue in Jehovah's Witnesses is hot. And training children uh, the way that they have, and then shunning children, all of this is at the boiling point in Europe. We did this. We trained our son. We whipped our son. I mean, not horrible, but we did it because the Bible said so when he was met. To train him in the religion. This is not acceptable. You can't, uh, uh, no, any longer in some countries, you can't disfellowship a child. Um, you can't uh, even ch try to train a child in your religion in one particular country. They have to make that decision on their own. We did it all for our son. And our son didn't make choices for himself. We made the choices. Those are the things I, re I regret. I regret not allowing him to find himself and his own personality. We all did that. You did it with your kids. And and uh, who are they? No, we made them who they are. And was that fair? This religion did this to us, and we let it because we liked it. We wanted everything controlled. It looked calm. It looked easy. We didn't have the up and down of life that everybody else had, or so we thought. That's how I feel about it. That's how I. Oh, okay, Barbara. We've got we've got Chicago, Illinois coming in. Go ahead, Chicago. What do you want to say to Barbara? Uh, I don't know if that's me or not. If you can hear me, uh, I just had a question. I know we've talked in the past about the writing department being responsible for keeping the message on point, that the so-called governing body is kind of the face of the whole thing, but. Yeah, I always hear about this being a corporation, that there are stockholders. And I just wondered if you um, were privy to any instances where the stockholders, uh, those that have some kind of say in Watchtower, have you ever had instances that you've heard of? Maybe there was a change in policy or procedure or even in the message as a direct result of those that have stock in the company. Would you, if you would just break that down a little bit, because I had an interruption there. And I had to stop listening to you and, and appoint the direction to my husband of something that he needed immediately. Okay, please just try that again on me. <laughs> oh, sure. I was just asking, those that have stock in the watchtower, uh, which is my understanding is why they have to have their annual meeting that's a legal requirement because they're a corporation and so forth. Yeah. Do you know yeah. of any instances 
where those that have that stock in the company have had a say in a change in policy or procedure or even in a message uh, from no. what? No, 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 no. The, those who have the uh, a share, yes, like the was uh, 500 at one time. It's, I think it went down to 300. And um, they just vote on when they kept together at the annual meeting. They just vote on the uh, president, keep the, keep them president, vice president, and secretary treasurer. But putting any um, uh, pressure on the organization, it doesn't come from. It could come from some uh, uh, very um, well known and big contributors to the organization. They could have a little more influence. Uh, on certain governing body members. And then, you know, it's like us all. You have friends, they tell you, make suggestions what to do in, in a matter, and then you you either do it or you tell someone else and you use your power and whatever. That's, they're just as human as everybody else. Do not think that any which way. Think it off. I gave it. Uh, I'm a nobody. And I, I gave uh, advice. At, at times to people. They asked for advice because they didn't know anything. They were guys who grew up at Bethel. They were coming there when they were 19 or 18 or 17, way back when it was 16, 17. And they didn't have the slightest idea of the world. And uh, so I've had sit down conversations with, with men at Bethel, asking me questions about accounting, for instance, and I've talked about that in the past and other issues where I got to express myself. I telling you, I talked about abortion. That is quite a discussion I had on abortion in this with this organization. And um, and the response that I got from uh, from one of the top guys. So uh, as far as uh, influence, uh, I know men who were very, very rich and uh, had a lot of influence with uh, some of the guys that, uh, who were at the top. And so it, money did make a, a big difference, that's for sure. Is that a, does that answer your question or what? Yeah, it, it does. Is it safe to say that we don't know who are the owners of the shares? In other words, could they be witnesses as well as non-witnesses? Or is there no. just no way of knowing? Well, the, uh, the way it was, uh, you had to be a, a Jehovah's Witness, and usually you were um, prominent. You know, you had to be in uh, all the ones I ever knew were elders. I, I, maybe there were others that weren't, but I didn't know them all. And we saw the group, they'd come to the annual meeting, and uh, they'd be there in the morning, and then we'd have the annual meeting uh, show, <laughs> the big extravaganza in the afternoon. Uh, and so... Um, uh, they were usually very prominent people. Out of Texas, there was a very big group that loaned a lot of money to the organization. And Joe and I knew some of the people uh, from years and years and years ago when we were younger, and they were all younger, and then they grew uh, They were big businessmen. You had out of, out of Atlanta, big businessmen. That, uh, but the, uh, the some of the people that I knew that were uh, – a share, a share or shares they bought they um it, it isn't run like you can't own part of the organization it was just merely a, a an organizational bylaw to have this many people vote for president vice president and officers you know but it was the money as far as uh, uh ten, you know it used to be the ten dollars and uh got you one share uh, I don't, that arrangement was gone a long time ago. Um, okay. There's a there's a guy who's got a book out who, and, and he discusses it. And I'm trying to think of his name right now. Um, hmm. Anyway, uh, the, uh, you can't compare the, or, the or corporations of the world to Jehovah's Witnesses Corporation. They set up exactly the way their legal department wanted it. If anybody runs this organization, it's the legal department. And I can't tell you strong enough. I interviewed one of the prominent uh, lawyers who is now deceased, but I interviewed him for the um, uh, Proclaimers book. 
And he told me quite a lot on um, what he was working on and uh, to do with the organization. Uh, there was there's a guy he's 82 years old right now and uh, he's a, he, he is a, a wheeler dealer as far as I'm concerned and a Beth a Bethelite and he's been uh, pushing his his will in the organization for years all the blood doctor and everything it's all his and uh, he had a lot of control over Lloyd Berry and one of the paralegals, uh, who I worked with for six months in the legal department for the writing department. See, I wasn't just just doing one thing. I was working on the 30th chapter of the Proclaimers book, which is legal stuff. So I had to be in the legal department to do all that and, 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 and in, their, in their library. And so uh, one of the paralegals told me that who in the writing department is influential over, has the ear of Lloyd Berry. And she said, if Lloyd, if this guy didn't have his ear, we wouldn't have the blood doctor in the way it is today. See all the inner sanctum and stuff. And, and so I can say that that's all human stuff. I, it's just, if I had a high position, maybe I would have done the same thing. I don't know, but as far as God directed, how could you have a God directed a Holy Spirit? Uh, they even admit that governing body is not spirit directed. Remember in the Watchtower, <laughs> and so um, it, 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 why do people belong to it uh, and they stay with it because it's comforting to them that there's hope for the future. And um, well, thank you, thank you very much. I answered my question. Thank you very much. Well, Barbara, I mean, that's great. You can answer his question. Now, I told you uh, last time we talked that I wouldn't leave you on after an hour and a half. So we did enter that realm. Mm, so I'm going to yeah, say. I, I wanted to uh, look up a book here and get the name of it to give. Okay, go ahead. Okay, here. All right. Um, you know, it's uh, uh, Bruce Schultz. A separate identity. His books have some of the, uh, even though he's a JW, he's done mammoth amount of research. And uh, he has some chapters in there that are really good. Now he's, I don't agree with everything. He, he says, I couldn't agree. I don't have all the paperwork he has, but there's some things that he has said on the legal end. I absolutely uh, disagree. And I would take him on in a minute. He just doesn't know that I know better than he because I was there and he was never there and he doesn't know what he's talking about. And uh, so I know that there's some of the legal decisions that were made over the years, he has it wrong uh, because I saw it in black and white. I also know uh, something about the uh, wrestles and the situation with uh, uh, the, the divorce that had to do with people that were in the higher ups in the corporation and um he he just is, is bordering there and he talks about the shares he, he has some some good stuff there on the shares and um uh you know i wasn't open to i didn't know certainly i didn't know everything and and between us all we put together including ray put together a pretty good uh description of how this organization works but i'm as curious as anybody i'm wondering who really sometimes i think who really operates this organization the millions and millions and millions of dollars that go through the, their hands and and what what they're doing in ramapo why why well, are they we have, we have a call bob we have a call that wants to come in go ahead go ahead we got new hampshire looks like go ahead 603 yes go ahead hi hi my name's Tom uh, from the MJ. Barbara, yeah. thank you so much for everything that you have done. You have been just so inspiring to oh. so many people. You have helped change so many people's lives. And I so. really love listening to you and your wealth of knowledge and information. Um, I grew up around the, in, the, in the 80s when I was... Uh, I was I was an unbaptized publisher, and when I left in uh, at eighteen, 
I was shunned for two years by my own mother, you know? And I mean, I would see her in the store um, and she would act like I was dead. Um, and then they, all of a sudden, the truth changed. And now all of a sudden, because I wasn't baptized, I, um, she could talk to me. You yeah. know, so we're uh, 100% right about how terrible they treat children. And to, to, to convince them to get married, I mean, baptized at such a young age, uh, it's, 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 it's a horrible thing. And I uh, thank you so much for all your insight. And, and thank you for saying that. And because um, I want to I want to help people to free themselves from this. I mean, you, these kids are marrying because uh, they can't even kiss before they get married. They have to have a chaperone. They, well, it wasn't like that when we were, uh, were dating. And I dated a Bethelites because I lived in Long Island. And um, I'm not saying I went around and kissed them all, but that's, uh, we didn't need a chaperone. And we had a lot of fun. And, and uh, the kids, I had a great time back then. And, uh, but the organization changed. And as it, as the rule, the rules, I think sometimes the rules came from old people and, or the, they are, uh, uh, they're too hard on, on each other even. And, uh, so it, it didn't, it isn't healthy. It isn't healthy at all. And so you have these kids and they marry, so they're going to have sex. And by the time they're 35, they're divorced. When I was Bethel 30 years ago, the divorce rate was equal to what was out in the world. But you wouldn't get that from the writers. The writers said, oh, this wonderful brotherhood. Oh, we're better than anywhere else. It's because they said it and we believed it. And it wasn't true. 85% back then of the kids were leaving the organization. I heard that statistic from one of the senior writers. So... What they presented in the literature was a dream world. But the truth was, it's just like anybody else's organization. They had just as much difficulty. Maybe they didn't have a, it was a little safer amongst the witnesses because basically we were, uh, good people were attracted to the organization. Uh, one time our, our son was nearly killed at Bethel. He was working in, in um, uh, putting in a new elevator and uh, one one of the guys who was newer at Bethel came in, and he was in an organization a year. And this guy, and uh, he, uh, my son said, he said, I nearly lost my life. He said, I nearly lost my head. He said that guy dropped. He was a four or five flights up, and he said, he, he it was obvious that he personally dropped something that would have beheaded me had I not looked up at that second and moved out of the, where he was. You, they were all uh, at one time they're coming in the organization so fast. And uh, George Kelch, who was a home overseer, he told Joe and I, he said, every application, you ask, uh, were you on a, ever on drugs? Every single boy that put in uh, application said yes. So, uh, yeah. I wonder we, we had a safe organization, but they hid the secrets. I got to tell you, the service department, they, after a hundred and something years, well, specifically when they started putting together the service department, 1926, 28, uh, they, they must have secrets like the United States government has, I swear, because those guys are always on the phone listening to people calling up and talking about very uh, secretive and uh, awful stuff. And they have files and files all in their systems on this. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong, but it's just, a, it's just an organization of people, ordinary people. And they tried to make them not ordinary people, try to mold them into this Bible perfection. It didn't work, it doesn't work. And you, the results are what I see today, and uh, very unhappy suicides. The young people, it's and and we wouldn't exaggerate. I would never exaggerate if it, but it's true. Uh, so it is nothing worse than being shunned by your your own parents. And you, you, you I had my little brother. He was only five years old when I left that first time, and. I couldn't 
speak to him anymore, and he didn't understand. But it, it, it did. It was very, very. Uh, yeah, it, it was awful. It was awful. So anyway. Yeah. I want, to, I want to add to that. What you didn't know and what the flock doesn't know is in the manuals, the elders' manuals. They have said this from the time when, they, when the attention book uh, manual came out. There were three three or four uh, four-page um, instruction sheets to, that came to elders. And then they put them all together and added to it. And they ca came out with the manual on at attention of the flock. And in there, I did the research, and and I got every one of those manuals, and 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 when they would update them, all the way till November of last month, and it says in every one of them that families can associate with this fellowship, people. And uh, uh, it says you just can't talk about spiritual things, and they italicize the word spiritual in the later one books in the in the uh, shepherding book. It's all there. You do not complain about the disfellowshipping process uh, when you're disfellowshipped. You can associate with your relatives. They, of course, they say, say elders should reason and try to talk to you, but there is no law and no rule that you can say that uh, disfellowship people can't talk uh, to their relatives. Now, if you're not a relative, they got a paragraph there, and this is on the same page, uh, which talks about the judicial hearing, when to call a judicial hearing. And you cannot call a judicial hearing if you are associating, uh, or they can't call one if you're associating in the congregation uh, with a disfellowship relative and uh, don't talk about spiritual things. And I think uh, they, uh, well, I know why they did it. They did it for legal reasons. So that if they're taken before the court over disfellowship, they say, we don't interfere in, in family relations. Don't think we do, but yet the elders, absolutely. Uh, do they not know that this is in their elders book? Yeah. But do they care? I don't think so. And uh, I don't have don't know that. Right? Right. Frank Wilde don't know that. My my mother thought that she had to, she thought she had to treat yeah. me like again. I agree. I was stunned myself when I saw this. Somebody pointed this out to me a few years, not that many years ago, and said, did you ever see that? I said, well, I read the whole thing in the shepherding book. But, you know, your eyes glaze over. And it's the way that they have that word. It almost like backwards. And uh, I'll, I'll uh, send a, a, that page to Rick, and he can put it up one day so people can see it. Um, I made a screenshot of it. And, you know, that, you know uh, they what they do to protect themselves in court, but what they do in in the congregation is a totally different thing. And now they're getting socked in Europe over this, over in um, uh, where, where I think Norway, I believe it is, um, finding out little by little what the problems are over there because of the very thing. They lie to the authorities over disfellowshipping children. It's just, they, they say one thing and then the, they say, well, it's in your book. This is in your book that you do disfellowship children. Oh, we don't disfellowship children. I mean, there's a, it, it's always something with these guys. That's a theocratic uh, warfare. And uh, what, how, what, how can you go to sleep at night when you know you're lying? Uh, hello, Barbara. Yeah. Thank you, Barbara. You're welcome. Hello. Yeah. Uh, Barbara, uh, I would uh, uh, like to discuss with you just for a few minutes uh, the new light, which is a policy, I would call it, that the Watchtower has leaned on through the years. And uh, it's been quite a problem. The way I have it figured is when you search the scriptures on a particular doctrine, 
for example, the atonement. Mm -hmm. And you gather all the details and you formulate a doctrine on the atonement. Right. As time goes on, you may get some new details, more light or new light, but the original doctrine that you put forth cannot change because if it does change, then that means you were wrong. Now, the watchtower, there is a list of things. That mm. What? What's happened? everyone. Hold on, Barbara. Hold on, everyone. Our phone line goes off every six hours, so we're going to shut it down now. We're going to get the phone line back on. We'll get Kurt back on with us. Don't go anywhere. Uh, we'll be right back on. Let's bring. Let's get the phone line back hooked up. Every six hours it goes off, so let's do it right now. We're calling in, so we'll get, uh, we'll get everyone back on again, so don't go anywhere. Stay with us. Welcome into the live six screens conference call. Yeah, we have a telephone line that's hooked up here to in. our whole system. To speak up and talk. And press every six hours it does go telephone. off on its own. When you are but done we'll talking, get it back in here very, very shortly. So don't go anywhere. We'll have Remember, Kurt back on. Unmuted. We'll bring the Barbara back on and, and it'll all be fine. So don't, uh, don't, don't leave us now. We hope you enjoy the programs tonight. You will now be placed into the conference. If you are the host, please enter your... Yes. Thank you. So we'll bring there it right are. in right now. So it'll be fine and dandy. We get Barbara coming back on the with recording us. Recording has started. Want to comment on that? Thank you. You did. You did. All right, uh, Kurt, are you back on there with us? Uh, yes, I'm still here. I. Yeah, our phone, our, phone, our phone line our phone line goes out every six hours, so it went out right out in the middle of what you were saying to Barbara. So why don't you uh, continue on with Barbara, and she'll be able to hear you, okay? Okay. Can she hear me now? Can you hear I him, Barbara? Do. Okay. Okay. Oh, yes. <laughs> uh, okay, Barbara. I don't. I don't. Thank you for talking to me. I don't know how much of that you heard. Yes, I heard about the tone with the watchtower. Yeah. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, you want to talk? Changing from the atonement, the belief, how they changed it, that shows they were wrong. That's what uh, you said. I was using that as an example. I'm not saying that they changed their views on the doctrine of the atonement, but they changed their views, you know a lot better than I do, on various things where the foundation... This session is no longer being recorded. Yeah. Where the foundation... Uh, of the doctrine that they were teaching uh, was changed with new light. Right. So I'm thinking that if that's true, with the, when the foundations changed with new light, then that obviously would mean to me that the original teaching was incorrect. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And well, I know you've seen a lot of that. Uh, you know, w with all your years in the watch. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm done. I just wanted to bring mm -hmm. that up and you can, I'll just listen to you now. Go ahead. No, I appreciate where you're coming from. And so that's why uh, when I was assigned something specific on doctrine, I would have to start from scratch and take a look at where it originated. And, and you know, it was, uh, you could do that. Because uh, we have all of these uh, 50,000 pages of Russell's writings. And so you could see where they were coming from on the doctrine. And, um, of course, uh, he was looking for uh, different uh, things in a belief uh, than 
um, others were looking for at that time period. That was a very, very interesting time period that Russell uh, came, um, to, you know, became prominent. And, um, and there were very strong reasons why his message was acceptable, but he was changing things. And they always said, well, we, the more we study, the more we see, uh, uh, we see the truth of the matter. Uh, but but uh, it, it's, it's a three ring circus. You start reading all, all the stuff and I did have to on certain subjects. So I think the atonement is an example of, of how the, they change. They, you know, they, it's three different subjects, ransom and uh, substitution and atonement. And, um, and how uh, they felt about that, or Russell felt about that, and then how they slightly, a slight of hand on this and a slight of hand on that. You hardly recognize that, there were, that it was something different. Uh, but that's the way, it, it, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, say anything that about religion. It's a, a personal matter, and if people are comforted by religion, that's perfectly all right with me. We have the freedom to do that. And um, but on the other hand, uh, you look at the leaders of religion, where this uh, certain groups came from, and and then you um, you see the directions that they head off into uh, because of their interests. And so um, the, the watchtowers prime re religious belief, absolute prime one was the ransom. Nobody else but believed in the ransom. It was never uh, uh, described like uh, Russell did. And then he sort of changed it too, as time goes on, a development, right? The development of a religion. And uh, that's what's fascinating about this. If I had three lifetimes, I'd still not understand it all. But to talk about it, uh, it's just too lengthy. Um, some some believe that, y you know, at Jesus' death, uh, that is uh, uh, what was the most important thing, Jesus' death. Uh, soon the watchtower started saying it wasn't Jesus' death, it was Jesus' resurrection that was... Uh, the important thing they uh, that's been argued for centuries it, it, it the yeah, argument, like you're saying even the doctrine of the atonement uh was changed from russell to uh, rutherford yeah exactly exactly and to remember all of this I, it, it, you just can't you're talking 140 years of of religion and uh but but not only you're talking about doctrine you're also talking about human nature and that enters into the picture or the one who has the doctrine or the belief. He's being driven by extenuating circumstances that wouldn't drive you. So you had issues. And so there were issues between Russell and Peyton, for inter interestingly enough. And the others that started the movement early with Russell. And then they went their own ways and started their own groups up. And um, it, it's a fascinating study. I love every minute of it, even to this day. To, I love uh, seeing the drama of this uh, introduction of a, a, a something that had become so powerful in this world to give people in the United States all the, the freedoms we have are due to the 47 wins at the Supreme Court level. And, and that's uh, extraordinary. And there are academic papers all over the place on this. I should know, I got uh, dozens and dozens of, of this stuff, of papers just on Jehovah's Witnesses and this, and Jehovah's Witnesses on that from, the, uh, from colleges and universities. Uh, fascinating. But what, uh, but the, the so it's so, so it is fascinating. It's great to, to learn all this, but when it harms, that's why I say I'm not going to discuss my personal beliefs about God. I'm just going to discuss the harm of a, a belief about God. If it harms people, 
And that's what the U.S. government and other Western governments say the same thing. Believe what you want. But you, when it interferes with the welfare of someone else, that's it. That's it. You crossed over. And so I don't talk about my beliefs. Why should I? I'm no expert on belief. I can't read between the, set, the, the sentences. I've read and read and read and read. And you always have more questions than you have answers. So um, uh, we do the best we can. But the thing is, we ha we're here a short time on the earth. Whatever you believe in the future, it's up to you. And then be happy with what you, the little you have in life. I'm afraid to be spoiled by being shunned, like you said, and your, and your mother shunning you. And all. That is a god awful thing I have ever seen. And it is really going to bring this organization down. And I got to tell you, there is stuff coming. It's a brewing, and it's going to come out of Europe against Jehovah's Witnesses on the shunning human rights. And boy, are they going into it. I know there's someone listening to me, and they're shuddering because of what's coming. And it will be in the next five years, I'm for sure, because it's already started in um, Sweden, Norway. And uh, Finland, no, but you got two major countries uh, that um, the branches are closed. Nobody wants them there. They don't because a human rights issue. So we could talk. Uh, one of these days is to get somebody on here, to, and I know of somebody who can talk about this, what's going on in there, and I'm learning from him of what's going on there. Well, sure, it's a, got a tiger by the tail when they start uh, uh, disfellowshipping children. Well, there you go, Bob. Oh, my goodness gracious. I mean, you, you, you said a mouthful tonight and a lot of people listening in. I uh, always say a mouthful, Rick. Well, I know, I know you do. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I never I, run out. I never run out. You, yeah. never run, you never run out of words. I mean, I say, you know, <laughs> how am I going to? How am I going to get Barbara back in control here? My goodness gracious, but you're oh, doing yeah. fine. Uh, all right, so that's it. I think we have one more person coming in here, do we? Did you want to speak up? Maybe not. All right. But anyways, Barbara, I, I told you I'd cut you loose after about an hour and a half. So you, uh, I, I know that you have other things to cater to tonight. So you go and do that. And uh, we're glad you came on with us. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> you're you're welcome and I appreciate that um, you have this program of all these years and a place for people to listen to other people talk about their experiences because that free is so freeing for them and when they hear that others suffer like they did uh, that's not comfort that's for sure but it makes them re realize that they were right, that they were right, that this is, was wrong of what this organization has done to people from the human level. And uh, they should, should never have, this should have never happened. And, and uh, uh, well, well, I'll tell, I'll tell you, Bob, one of the things was when I, when I was working my way loose out of the watchtower, and I decided to leave, I really had some ill feelings. I said, geez, what if this is the truth? Well, what, what, if, what if these guys really are telling us truth and I'm leaving, I'm going to be a dead duck at Armageddon? I mean, those thoughts <laughs> ran across my mind. But what happens here, there wasn't a forum like this. So now people coming in, they can listen in and they can say, geez, you know, it's not just Rick. There's other people, too, that feel yeah. the same way. So it, it kind of solidifies and lets them know that they're, they're, they're not wrong in their thinking. The Watchtower is incorrect, and it makes people feel better. Thank you, sure Bob. Yes. Thank, well, thank you for uh, inviting me. I'll, I'll try to think of another uh, subject for another time, and, uh, and maybe – well, I don't know. You know, you don't have the same – people listening each time to every other week to me. And so um, I don't want to be repetitive. But well, well, 
it's different people. So what we'll do is I'll be in touch with you in the next week or so. We'll go uh, maybe talk about Russell, talk about some other things, but we can yeah, bring that. Like that. Also, but, talk about but, uh, but thank you very much. I, I know that it's, it's not easy to come on and talk about all of these things and you, uh, you have a lot of things going on in your life, but we appreciate your presence here on the six screens. Now, Barb, you just rest good tonight and I'll be in touch with you in the next week or so. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And I'll say good night to everybody and thank you for listening and thank you for asking your uh, questions. And um, so I say adios. Bye-bye. Thank you, Bob. Yeah. Well, the, well, there you go. I mean, friends, we have more programs coming up here next. We're cutting Bob loose. But I want you to know that we really appreciate all the people that come in here, Barbara, with your program. We appreciate all the people calling in. I want to thank you for calling into the program here tonight. Now, we've got Aposta Babe. She is your favorite apost apostate. She's coming up next here on the six screens. Uh, she burns the midnight oil. Now, if you haven't talked to Aposta Babe, i tell you what. Yeah, I, th I think it would help you. I really, really do. A lot of people that are leaving the watchtower, they don't know what to do. They got to talk to someone. Well, if you if you're up tonight, you're pacing the floor. You don't know what to do. Call into a pasta babe. Let her know. Let her talk to her. Let her know you're thinking of her. I, I think it could really be great. We got a lot of people coming in from pretty much all over the world: Australia, United Kingdom, and they listen into a pasta babe and they speak up. So maybe you could do that as well. So we're looking forward to a pasta babe coming on here very, very shortly. So what do you guys think? I mean, not a bad program tonight, right? I, I think it went pretty good. I really, really do. And uh, I think on YouTube and all the different platforms we're on, uh, we're starting to get a lot of comments, a lot of comments on the programs. But, you know, I mean, this is really good. I'm, I'm really glad to be able to come on here live in live time, I, I would have loved that when I was leaving the Watchtower to be able to come on and talk to people in live time and say, hey, what do you guys think? What do you think about the United Nations? What do you think about this, that, and everything else? It would have really helped me a lot. But I didn't have that back then. We didn't have it. Uh, you know, the Internet was just getting going back in the early 90s. And I was trying to find out everything I possibly could, but we had to email. We didn't have the e internet as we have it today. We had to email and back and forth, but it's so much easier today. And that's why there's so many people that are leaving the watchtower. They're getting on the internet and the internet, as we always say, is a great equalizer. Well, what do you guys think? You want to say something? You want to speak up and talk before Pasta Babe comes on? The, by all means, do that. Uh, you want to say? Yeah, I have something to say. Uh, go ahead. You're on with us. Go ahead, sir. Well, all I can say, Rick, is this is um, a wonderful arrangement that you have. Um, and I would say, ten years ago, there's no way I could have done this with the phone charges and stuff like that that we used to have to go through. But with my my uh, smartphone, I can listen to you. And it doesn't cost me a dime. And and to listen to everybody's experiences, and I, it's it's wonderful therapy. I don't, uh, you know, it has been a long, long road, um, and I am still finding myself needing to hear all of you people and your experiences just to keep my own sanity because uh, I, and I, I don't even know why. I just know that that's, uh, that's where I'm at and I really appreciate it. And that's all I wanted to say. And I, I love the way that you have so many options for people to join in. Uh, I watch your stuff on YouTube. I listen to you and I got to speak to Barbara Anderson tonight. That is amazing to me. That to me is like speaking to a celebrity because she is a celebrity in my mind because she has done so much great work. And thank you for having this offering this option for us. 
Yeah. That's what I want to say. Well, thank, thank you. Well, thank you. I know you're a fellow New Englander here. I know you're coming in from New Hampshire. So do you mind yeah. if I, can I ask you where in New Hampshire? Is that okay? Yeah, Meredith. Oh, Meredith. Okay. No, I know where that is. So was that the, yeah. you, was that your, 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 your fiance that called in two yes, weeks? It, yes, it was. Yeah, yes. Well, well, we're going to get you guys on. I, I, I got your email. We're going to, we're going to get you guys on here for probably in the next couple of weeks. I'm going to write to a uh, fiance and talk to her and, and, and you as well. And, and see if we can't get you come on and talk about your dealings with the Watchtower. So thank you for coming in tonight. I really appreciate it. Thank you for speaking up and talking. Appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome, and thank you even more. Okay. Well, uh, with that being... well I'll tell you what. That, this isn't that, that, this, yeah, well, well, that's amazing. That's amazing that you feel that way. But, you know, I'll tell you what. You feel so uh, happy and so gratified that boy you're listening in to all of these people but I'm, I'm happier than you are that you called us in tonight thank you sir thank you very much hey, uh, see you hey, Rick. Coming in. <laughs> bye 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 all right well let's, hey, Rick. yeah go ahead hey i got something for you yeah uh, why don't you think about doing a, a christmas two things what is, why don't you think about doing a christmas special where where people can gather their thoughts or maybe email you you know uh being a like what? What Christmas means to them after they leave the Watchtower? I think I think a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, will will tune into that. Yeah. And the other thing is, you yeah. know, and the the other thing, you know, what is a good game? I think he, uh, my brother and I play it. You know, when we when we get together, is you get the Revelation book and you just you just swing the pages, and then you just you know you pick a page, and it's funny because like Cedar Point, Ohio, is the first trumpet. Oh my God! With all the things that are happening in the world, you know, with uh. World War Three and everything and all the pandemics, and Watchtower is saying that the trumpet of Revelation is Cedar Point, Ohio, and I, I just think like if you had like a show, like a one-hour show where people just call in and say, hey, "This is the best, this is the best one of the Revelation book," and what you do is you're laughing at them, and and, and when you laugh at them, nothing pisses off a tyrant more than when you say the emperor has no clothes. So, but I think that Revelation book is just. It's a gold mine. It's, oh, yeah. it's, uh... <laughs> well, well, it is. It, it is. I, 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 Gilbert, I have to agree with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for checking in. Okay. Appreciate Merry it. Merry Christmas. Well, Merry Christmas. We we always do a Christmas special anyway, so we'll, we'll do it again this year, but thank you for suggesting that. All right. Let's see what's going on. we got a pasta, babe. She's going to be coming on here, so I'm going to bring her on, and uh, we'll see if we can. I'm going to add to the stream. Hello, Linda. Well, it's going really good. Things are moving in the right direction. Lots of people coming through here tonight. So you're going to get all this stuff adjusted. Then we're going to get your program going. So what's on your mind tonight, Linda? Oh, yeah, no, he was right up here in Boston, not far from where I live. So, yeah, I'd like to hear what you have to say. I was going to bring it up tonight. We didn't have time. I mean, every time I go to do the news here on Saturday night, I can't even I, I can't even get through all the stories. People just keep, boom, they keep coming in. But it's good. I like to hear what the people have to say. So we're going to bring you on here very shortly. So why don't you hang in here with us? And let me just make sure we have all the clips up. We're going to go live on all the different platforms we're on. So we've got 10 different platforms, Linda. So let's see what happens. We're going live right now. And uh, let's see what goes on. You are on the Six Cranes Telenetwork, the go-to site for your infinite source of precise, reliable, and factual material exposing the Watchtower organization. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome in to our midnight show. We have Linda James, your favorite apostate, apostababe. 
Her program burns the midnight oil right here on the six screens. So hello, Linda James. Well, I'm telling you what, Susan. I mean, Susan. Yeah, I mean, Linda. We are doing great. Well, 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 well what are they after, after, after seven hours of going here? I, I can get them mixed up. But I'm glad you're on with us. And, and we're, we're going to have a great program tonight. Everything's going to be wonderful. And I'm so glad that you can do this. Uh, we have a lot of people that are still listening in. So I'm going to cut you loose. And I know some of these people will want to speak up and talk to you. So I'm here if you need me. Thank you, Linda. Very well.
I sure do. Hi, Linda. Hi. Fine. This is uh, Carrie. Uh, listen, th this is the biggest joke I've ever heard. First of all, this young guy turns around and he and he chooses a profession where he is a gun carrying cop, which could result in him killing somebody. All right. So that's kind of against everything that the Watchtower taught uh, or the organization or whatever you want to call it. And, and then he says that it's against his religious, um, uh, what was that term? Uh, religious. <sighs> yeah. That he couldn't take that he couldn't take a vac the vaccine. It was against his religious. Um, he needs to have a religious exemption. That's a joke because the Watchtower has said they wanted everybody to have the uh, vaccines. What is this guy? Where is he coming from? Um, That is a this, listen. There's something wrong with him, and now he's claiming all these things. I mean, they could blow him away in the court so easily, just by finding out what Jehovah's Witnesses believe and what's the common denominator here with the vaccines. That is the stupidest thing I've ever heard. Well, one of the stupidest things. I mean, I mean, a cop, you know, um, their life is uh, at risk every day. And so is in everybody else's because they are carrying the gun and the badges. So he chooses a profession like that. We, you know, I remember years ago that um, they, they told us not to have uh, weapons, no guns. 
you know, uh, it was kind of like, you know, we, we, we just couldn't, it was unheard of. I mean, and he chooses a profession like this. Yeah, in 2019. Where is he? And he's from Massachusetts, right? Where, where in the heck is he getting his information that he can't take the shot, the vaccine? Where is he getting? I, boy, I'm going to tell you something. He's going to lose his case. Because any smart lawyer will do their homework on Jehovah's Witnesses. This is ridiculous. Ridiculous. Poor thing. He's having a nervous breakdown. Well, isn't that too bad? Oh, yeah. Right. Absolutely. I was brought up uh, by a police, well, he was my stepfather. From the time I was eight, he went on the force, 26 years, believe me. I, I, they, carry, <clears throat> they carry guns and everything else, weapons and, you know, <clears throat> when you choose a Jehovah's Witness, becoming a cop is, is, is the craziest thing I've ever heard of. I don't know what everybody's thinking is today. Maybe be, maybe because I'm an old school. <laughs> and, um, and and I, I don't know what their congregation is thinking when he did this, why he, he wasn't spoken to. Uh, it makes, this just doesn't make any sense at all. Oh, I, they're going to tear him apart on the stand. Come on. Ah. Oh. Well, wait, wait, wait. That, yeah, wait, wait. They're going to tear tear this uh, apart just with one thing. Do Jehovah's Witnesses take vaccines? All it takes is one to say, yep. Well, anyway, I, I mean, I listened, I listened, and I thought, this is getting weirder and weirder. Uh, I've never heard of anything. Yeah, well, I'm sure there's other people out there that would like to um, make a comment, but... I mean, I held back waiting for you to finish. And I'm like, I can't say this is the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, thanks. thanks for putting up with me.
I still have my problems, but <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay, love you too. <laughs> All right. Muting myself. <laughs> Bye. Linda. Uh, yes. Oh, go ahead. I was saying, I was going to say I'm surprised that nobody is calling in. I was just about to agree. I was just about to agree. I think it's ridiculous. I think yeah. I I also think it's ridiculous, and I think it's even more ridiculous in our current system of things that he's asking for a. a a jury, because I can't imagine there's going to be any Jehovah's Witnesses on that jury, and pretty much everyone except Jehovah's Witnesses hates Jehovah's Witnesses. <laughs> and at the moment, people aren't very happy with police officers either. So it seems like he's just gone down like a, a definite, a definite lose situation. Which is fine. I don't mind. I really hope he fails. <laughs> I mean, it's good that he that he's that I think he'll fail. I mean, that's good, but it seems so strange that he's doing it in the first place. No jury is going to be is going to say that's okay. Strange. Very strange. I agree with the first lady that called up. It's very strange and very stupid. <laughs> and um, I'm not sure what happens and how it works in America, but in Australia, if I am to sue somebody or do that and I lose, I have to pay for their court their court fees. So if that's the case for him, that seems even crazier. Okay, actually, probably got. Um, he's being kind of manipulated by um, a, a lawyer, you know, that just wants money. Well, I can't, there you go. Yeah, you're definitely going to win this one, bro. <laughs> Ask for more money. We're probably going to get it. Maybe that maybe he has a lawyer that's on our side. Maybe he does, and the lawyer is just sitting there laughing, waiting and laughing. <laughs> mm. Hello, Linda. Hi. I agree with you 100%. It sounds like it's what they call a frivolous lawsuit. And if it's a frivolous lawsuit, um, they can't really collect any money. And anyway, the lawyers, they have fact checkers, don't they? And if they would just call the Watchtower Society, the, the main office, they, they would say that it was up to the man's conscience whether he wanted a shot or not. And in fact, they promoted them. So I don't know where he has a leg to stand on, except that he'll probably have to pay court costs. wanted to agree with you. I just wanted to agree with you. I think you're you're right in bringing this up. You know, it shows the kind of people that the quality of people who are Jehovah's Witnesses today. And you're wondering, well, oh, there's always the bottom of the barrel here. Yeah. Right. Thank <laughs> you. 
it's a dangerous game to play. I mean, I remember specifically reading on the Watchtower Awake magazine, um, and it was maybe 20 years ago, that, talking about um, how police officers and uh, security guards who had to put their guns down, you weren't allowed to be a witness and carry a gun. So if he's a witness carrying a gun, they could disfellowship him. Why would he admit that? In open court. Right. I Hello? Yeah, this is Jeff. Uh, I, I was going to say he's just trying to bluff his... Hi. Uh, yeah, he's just trying to bluff his way to keep his job and cover his ass. That's all that was. Oh, if that's what he's doing, if that's what he's doing, he... He's done. He'll lose so quickly. And you know, the joke of all, <clears throat> that this lawyer of his is going to win, lose, or draw, he's going to be paid. He has to be paid. And um, what does he care? He's got a case. Yeah, that's what I honestly think a stupid lawyer has suggested this stupidity. Because he's going to get paid regardless. Linda, Linda, if he's if he's court appointed attorney, he's paid by the court no matter what. And that guy can tell him this BS and, and that I'm sure most lawyers would not know the difference. They they know it's pretty well known that witnesses can't get blood transfusions, but as far as vaccines, you know, he probably bluffed his way if it's a court appointed attorney, but if he got his own attorney, he would have had to come with up with some money himself, and he probably did, you know. But but I'm not saying that a court appointed attorney wouldn't wouldn't ride with this and try to bluff the court, you know. And he would he probably don't even know. I'm just saying. So this this guy is trying to bluff everybody. That's that's all I'm trying to bluff the court, everybody, and and uh, it probably ain't gonna work. So, can I just make another point? Well, one more point. I thought as to why it's so stupid that you would be claiming that you're a Jehovah's Witness seeking religious freedom in court is 
the last times that people remember them doing that have not been really great times. So, like, most people would remember that the last time they complained that they're not getting religious freedom would be, what, the Royal Australian Commission? So it's even stupider to be jumping in when you're not a Jehovah's Witness, pretending to be a Jehovah's Witness, wanting religious freedom, when everyone remembers the the Australian Royal Commission or what's happening in Norway, which also doesn't look good. So it seems even stupider that you'd be jumping on the, jumping on this ridiculous bandwagon now. What an idiot! <laughs> That's my point. Bottom line, Linda, is you cannot serve in the military or be a police officer and be a Jehovah's Witness or a Jehovah's Witness. You, I was told. What, what's that? Yeah. Yeah. Law enforcement or the military being a Jehovah's Witness. That is, it, it, it's taboo. You can't do it. They, I, I was told that. Because I want to call the national I, I wouldn't do it because they told me I couldn't. So anyway. Yeah, the, the elder brought me in in the rural community that I'm living back in now. Uh, he had a uh, he had a shotgun and he had a rifle. So there you go. And in uh, 1820, so. You know, Linda, the first five minutes that this prosecutor is in this case is going to blow him away. First of all, when this prosecutor gets that um, case, the first thing he's going to do is check on the, the status of this man as a Jehovah's Witness. And he will find out exactly what they believe in. Then when they get to court, I mean, it's all over five minutes. This prosecutor, is gonna, you know, I, I, I cannot understand any of this. I, I, I really, it, it, it's blowing my mind. Uh, um, how you can bring it that far. It, it, and say the first words out of his mouth, religious exemption. Where is he getting this from? That was the only exemption. We we don't have. The, oh, as far as joining the service, um, we have that. Yeah. Well, not we, but we did. Well, I hate to say we, but that's part of. The you you can't, but um, I mean, uh, seriously, they'll check on the wife, her standing, and everything else. I mean, this, this prosecutor is is got a, a loaded case, and he's well, gonna win. Well, ma'am, if that's if they dig deep enough, I mean, oh, they're gonna dig. I mean, he's well, asking for two million. Come on. They're going to dig. Okay. It, it, it just depends what's involved. You know, I mean, if there's a lot of money or uh, it sounds like there is, or somebody got killed or hurt or what have you, they'll dig. But 
you know, I mean, sometimes they won't dig. He's saying I think it's probably right, probably is his rights are being violated. That's crazy. I think it'll be as easy as asking what congregation he's in and then asking someone from that congregation whether they whether he attends meetings. Right. What is his standing? Exactly. Yeah. Well, we got this all solved. <laughs> I mean, Sweet. He's, a, um, he's cooked. Let me tell you. <laughs> there's one thing. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hi, Apostle Dave. It's Weston again. Uh, I just want to point out just the obvious. Uh, I'm all right, all things considered, but I kind of just like to point out just kind of how ridiculous it is to think that there is something in any version of the Bible that you could extrapolate to where they understood what a hypodermic needle was or, or is. I mean, they just, they just had no understanding of it at all. And the verse talks about consuming blood. And all they talked about was just, you know, and I have a, I do have another talk, uh, topic to talk about, uh, the canines were brought up earlier, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just like, you know, the, the, the verse on abortions and numbers, you know, it's like people, they, they read, they read what they want to read and they dismiss what they want to dismiss. And I mean, as far as truth value goes, it's like, I mean, yeah, you, you just put whatever put whatever you want. I mean, it's like it's not blood. I mean, you're not consuming blood in the form of, you know, like cannibalism or, you know, uh Oh yeah, entirely. I mean that that verse more or less goes to, you know, not consu I I can't I'm pretty sure it says the consumption of, of human blood. Because um, there I mean there's dishes where you can make blood out of, you know, from you know, cows and stuff and goats that are actually very healthy. I mean blood like blood soup, like what the Spartans Spartans made a uh particular dish whenever they were on campaign called blood soup which full of energy and stuff but uh yeah I, I mean i i can't not never being a jehovah's witness it's just it's i mean it's sad when kids die but honestly you know i'm all about the pursuit of happiness so i mean if your religion if you want to be happy dying because you know your religion doesn't want you to you know get a blood transfusion, then, you know, more power to you. Yeah. And the whole Jehovah thing, too. I mean, it's Yahweh. Like, <laughs> come on, guys. <laughs> you know?
Hey, Linda. Yeah, this is Jeff. I, uh, I'm for blood transfusions to save people's lives. And I, I'm just, everybody's listening. They need to talk to their doctors and let them know what Jehovah Witnesses do. They have a liaison team. They usually will go to the hospital. Will interfere with a person get a, getting a blood transfusion when they need it. And, you know, that's, that, I, I, I've talked to every doctor I know when I, I come in contact and say, hey, they're well dressed, they're well spoken, and they come in and they try to interfere. And you need to be aware of it. And, uh, you know, I, I, there was a story about a 14-year-old boy that his folks were witnesses, so was he. And, uh, you know, they, they didn't want him to get a blood transfusion to save his life, and he needed one. And he, uh, he expressed to the doctors that, I want to live. I'll, I'll take the transfusion. Well, his folks were in the way. Those doctors went to a judge, and there there was a li the liaison team from the congregation up there interfering, and his parents. And right away, that judge told him, he says, "If any of you people interfere, I will throw you in jail and throw away the key." That is transfusion. Yeah, yeah research me his name and get it to you but uh it's a true story so yeah they're they're nasty and and uh you know everybody's listening talk to every doctor you know and tell them hey you know they're trained these elders are trained to go up there and interfere and it's it's unbelievable they uh, research it on on a net i mean what they do and how they do it it's just Unbelievable. So, Well, you know, I tell you what, when, when, when I but Linda, when it comes to holding your feet to the fire and you're going to live or die, you may change your mind whether you sign that card before that or not. And that's, that's my point kind of here is, uh, you know, that's, uh, I don't know. I had several blood transfusions to stay alive, but I'll tell you what. Uh, before I be, I got involved in the truth or the so-called truth, I'll tell you what, when I kept talking to my mother about this organization, she says, you know what? She says, you wouldn't be here if me and your father were Jehovah's Witnesses. I stood with my blank mouth open. She turned around and walked away. So I wouldn't be talking to you right now if my folks were witnesses. So uh, that's where I'm at on that. I, I, I'll i never forget that. I I didn't have anything more to say to her. So. Yeah, I was, I, when I was a little boy, I, I, I didn't, uh, I, I wasn't creating white blood cells. And I had to take transfusion, and I forgot about it. But when she brought it up, you know, I wouldn't be here today because I almost died from not having those transfusions. So, yeah, those those people, yeah, that organization is they're guilty of a lot of death, people dying. They they need to be sued over this. 
They need to go back and find out all these kids, anyway, all these kids that died from not getting blood transfusions, they need to be sued over it immediately. I, I, I just, uh, it's kind of an emotional thing, but, you know, I mean, they're, they're going back on child molestation, which they should. They need to go back on, uh, on the blood doctrine, too. Well, sure. I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. And I'll, I'll tell you what, the ones that have succeeded with lawsuits, Watchtower probably gets that money. And that's what, that's what the nasty thing is about it. I mean, it's that organization just makes me sick. And I, I, I just wish more people would wake up that are going to the Kingdom Hall that believe in this organization, do your research on this, these, this nasty cult. I just, I don't know. It, it's unbelievable that people need to do the research. Linda, can I ask you a question? Okay, this is Carrie again. What is the difference between... Hi, honey. Uh, what's the difference between taking it in, taking the blood in, and then versus drawing it out? Many times, all of us have had to have... Um, blood drawn for one reason or another, you know, for testing, for an illness or whatever, or a deficiency or whatever. So if you, you're not allowed to take it, but what about drawing it out? Well, it's taking the blood out of your system. It's taking the blood out. It's still a needle going in your arm and taking it out. A needle goes in your arm to put it in. We're not supposed to take it in, but what was it? There was a scripture, and you know what? I can't remember uh, much of that stuff, but it said something about dropping your blood to the ground. It's better to something about um, the the blood it's better to drop it to the ground than ever some 
something like that. It's been so long, but it just dawned on me. And I thought, you know, we, we remove our blood all the time for many reasons. What's the difference? We're taking it out. We're putting it in. Many, many times people will store their own blood and have it, but they're not allowed to do that either. Right, right. Nothing makes any sense anymore to me anyways. Um, you know, I'm glad I'm out. I said, I'm so glad I'm out. I've been out for a very long time. But but the thing is, is that I was a believer a long time after. You know, I still believed it. It took me about nine years of deprogramming. And, you know, as, as all of us, there's always that little trigger thing that will happen that will say, oh, geez, maybe, maybe they're right about this or that. You know, it still happens because we're, that's the brainwashing. It, it, it goes pretty deep. The longer you've been, the longer, you know, I, I, I'll, t I'll tell you a quick little story, just a quick one. I was studying at the time. I had my uh, second child. She needed a blood transfusion. I had no concept of anything, but I said, no, you can't she cannot have it. Of course, my teacher was there. Um, you know, um, Bible uh, teacher was there uh, kind of encouraging me to to stop it. And the doctor says she has to have it. She's jaundiced and she's very little. And, you know, I delivered at six months of pregnancy. So she needs it. So I said no. So my mother, uh, I, now remember, I'm married. You know, I got married at 16. So uh, my mother comes marching into the hospital. She hears about this. And she gave the permission to give my daughter a transfusion. And I didn't find out after. Oh, yeah. I mean, at that time, at 62, oh, my God. She says, give that kid that transfusion. You know, I didn't find out about it until after but i was a little upset about it but my daughter is now what 60 uh 60 years old so thank you mom <laughs> right no thank you grandma you know for saving my life but um yeah it's you know back then things were a little bit different you know uh, it, it didn't matter whether i was married or not she 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 was my mother, and that's what she did. So, me, I think I was um, 18 when I had her. I was 18 and a half, almost nine. There's 19 months difference between my two kids. So, um, I had married a... Uh, uh, an inactive witness. That's how I got involved with all that mess. So, you know, he wasn't, but I, 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 um, enjoyed it. So, but, you know, I spent most of my life as a, a Jehovah's Witness, very happy in there, even though, you know, I, I suffered a lot, but still, you know, I, I thought I was suffering for God anyway. So that's, that's the way it goes. But anyways, yeah, that was interesting. Yeah, my mother put the kibosh on everything, and she says, give the kid the transfusion. Her. Said, hey. Bless her, ma'am. Huh? I said, bless her. Bless her, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, well, she's now passed away. But, you know, um, my mother was something else. She didn't like what I was doing, but. You know, um, I yeah, neither do mine. That, yeah. I was going to say that. That's why I donate blood today. Yeah, every month I donate blood. I let my beard grow long, my hair grow long, and I look like a hell's angel. So without <laughs> the tattoos. 
<laughs> so that's, there you go. That, that's some of my revenge towards that organization. Yeah, yeah. Besides, yeah. yeah. Besides, um, I'm, uh, tomorrow, Linda, and, and you, Jim, I'm uh, Council Bluff, Iowa, Omaha, Nebraska at 430 I'm having a uh, XJW startup group at Pizza King in Council Bluffs, Iowa. Wow. And I, I know it's probably far from everybody that's listening in, but, uh, you know, the pizza's free and the pop yeah, and everything go. else will be free. So will uh, try, everybody. <laughs> well, no, I'm in Connecticut, so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm a little bad, further man. away. Yeah, but they had, had some bit. people. We had some I people. I got a lot of takers, but anybody listening in that's in the area, please come. Southwest yeah. Iowa and eastern Nebraska, you know, that that's within the range. So, anyway. Ah, uh, shoot. I'm, I'm sorry. It, it, it's Pizza King. In Council Plus, Iowa, here, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it off here real fast. I'm, I should have that memorized or on paper, but I don't. Here. Oh, shoot. That's you real fast. It's on Broadway. Uh, just hang on a second. King. Here's the address, Linda. Ready? It's eleven oh one North Broadway, Council Bluffs, Iowa. At four thirty, and you you ask for Jeff Gathering. Post this, and what's that, ma'am? Yeah, yeah, we got it covered. And Dan and Angela are in behind it. They won't be there, but I'm I'm kind of hosting. But the hostess. You know, the restaurant, that's what you say is Jeff Gathering, and they'll send you to the tables. So, oh, yeah. We're, we're getting a lot of response. There's like, Linda, there's like, Kingdom Halls that are still going in this area, and I couldn't find an XJW group if my life depended on it. I mean, not saying there wasn't one, but I, I couldn't find one, so I'm starting one. So, Dan and Angela come through a while back and said, hey, get one started, and we'll help you do it, and uh, they're helping me, and we're, we're getting a lot of responses, so I think there's going to be some people there, so. Yes, I mean, uh, we need to do that all, you know, hey, there's more of us than there are of them now. I'll tell you that. I believe that, truly. And, and I, I think eventually we need to get a national effort going where people go door to door and tell people that this is a nasty cult and to stay away from them. And, and they're a cult in everybody's neighborhood. And they're, they, they're full of pedophiles. All they're about is getting money from you. They brainwash you. Once they got you in, they get your family in. They shun you. They destroy families. I mean, just give them the whole, uh, the whole taboo on them. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's what needs to be done. So, anyway...
Okay. Sure, sure. Like they do with watchtowers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I I gave a, my former Kingdom Hall. I gave a, re, a Google review, and I it all twice. They they got they got some power with Google, Linda. Because I'll tell you what, the first one I gave, I said. Doomsday cult. I will beware. Doomsday cult. And then I put forward slash hike and full group. Within two months, I was kicked off of there. And then I threw it back on there again. And within a week, it was gone. So they're, they're going to Google. Nobody contacted me. They went to Google and told me somehow they got power with Google to pull that off. But I don't care. Well, I was telling the truth. And anybody, their former Kingdom Hall, they need to go on there and give. A, a, you could be anonymous about it. You, I gave my name, my picture, even a picture, a picture of myself when I went to the Kingdom Hall, my full name. But if you don't want to, you could have, as you well know, Linda, you could have some kind of a, you know, a, a different name. Or, or call yourself something else and and give a review, you know, what you think of this organization. And, uh, yeah, I, I got kicked off twice. So, but everybody could do it. They can't. Linda, they can't do nothing about it, and people are afraid to give a review. Well, you're only telling the truth. The reviews are there for you. What I did is there's five stars. I gave one star, and I said what I just told you. So that's what people do. You know, I mean, and you know, just just to warn people about this organization, they're dangerous. But anyway. Oh, yeah. Yeah. You yeah. know. Thank you. 
yeah, but or or even just ten words. <laughs> you know, post it on their review. Believe me, they will get rid of it. They did mine twice, and they got power with Google, but who, who they can't do nothing to you. Yeah, I mean, it's just like Dan Clark. Dan Dan runs a business. He says, hey, you know, I got reviews. He says. I can't do nothing about somebody giving me a bad review. They didn't do nothing about me. They just don't. They, they got power with Google. I'll say that because they got mine deleted twice. So, but put her to put one up. I I encourage everybody. I left my name. I I even went with a like I said, Linda. I went with a picture, not what I look like now, but when I was real clean cut. I, I gave a picture of what I looked like back then when I went, when I was going to and everything else. So, yeah, I mean, my full name, I don't care. Just, I'm, I'm just saying, folks, don't be afraid to do it. If you, you can be anonymous doing it. So, that's about all I got to say on that. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. It'll be the first one. Yeah. Yeah. So. I, there's none around this area. And like I said, there's a lot of Kingdom Halls. And I could not find a, a group. And I'm the one that's starting it. So. You know, and Dan and Angela, they have a lot in part on this. So, uh, like I've said, so, yeah, we'll see how it goes. Thank you for having me, Linda. Thank you.
Um, yeah, it's Carrie again. How old is this uh, police officer? Oh, did you say how old he is? In 2019. Is that what you said? Hmm. Well, that prosecutor is going to make mincemeat out of him. And it won't take long. No. Right. You know what? You know, I was thinking if he is a true blue Jehovah's Witness, the first thing he's going to do is go to the elders about this and they're going to shoot him down. So I don't know. This whole thing Stinks. I mean, even if he's not baptized or if he's baptized, it, where he came up with that, that he's not allowed to take the shot because of his uh, religious beliefs is a lie. I mean, if he, if he was uh, of uh, uh, another religion, like, um, um, the uh, uh, um, Christian scientists—that's that's something else. You know, I mean, they they take no medicine whatsoever, not even an aspirin, a Tylenol, nothing, nothing. That I know because I worked for um, uh, a couple taking care of their children as their nanny many years ago, and. Uh, Believe me, if they had a headache, I would have to call up the mother at her job, and then they would call in one of the ministers, and he'd have to come over and take them into a room and pray with them and pray it away. It was, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, there is, there is no room for anything. No, you know, I... I, I'm familiar with them, but, um, yeah, so, I, I, I mean, first of all, if he's a witness, he would go to the elders and say, this is what I'm going to do, um, and first of all, he's, he's shaming the Jehovah's Witnesses in a way 
by taking this to court and saying that kind of stuff. It, 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 you know what I mean? They're put, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses don't like their name in the in the paper. They don't like it, um, you know, people talking about them in any shape. This is going to really uh, make them look bad. <laughs> yeah, it really is. Oh, I mean, since when? Yeah, uh, we are. <laughs> We're telling on them now because it's going to get around. It's got, somebody's going to hear this. Somebody's going to hear this. I mean, his name is out there now, so it's weird. You know, uh, I mean, I, I, I sure would like to know um, the congregation he's in, and I would make the call. Say, hey, listen, what's with one of your people out there? Liar. Yeah, right. He's a liar from the kids. <laughs> right. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah, no, really. <laughs> so, you know, this is the biggest joke. I mean, thank you for a good night. I'm not usually up. Anymore at this hour, but I really, you know, seriously, this has caught my attention. I, I, it, it, it just, I can't believe, I can't believe anybody would do something as stupid as this. I, 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 you got to keep an eye on this one and let us know what happens. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, it's going to be a while before that case comes up, but I, yeah, I'd like to hear the end result of this one. Oh. oh, my. Oh, my God. Yeah. Well, all righty. Time for me to go night-night. <laughs> Thank you very much for a great night. Yeah. Yeah. No. Not one second. No, not one second. There isn't a thing about this story that makes any sense. Anybody who has been a Jehovah's Witness knows. <laughs> you know, all of it. I mean, it, it. there's so many, like, little tiny details. 
I mean, this prosecutor, he's going to have a party. He is. He's just, he's going to start this stuff around. And he is going to blow this all away. He, it, it's pretty obvious, but I don't know. I don't know. Interesting. Interesting. Well, I better get myself going. I have still things to do. It's um, almost one in the morning, my time. So I better get myself going. All right, have a good night, honey. Bye-bye, darling.
second that for sure. <laughs> what? Uh, you forgot hanging lanterns from trees. That's also very pagan. Yeah, or Christmas Uh, yeah, I, I mean, that, that's basically what it is. It's just a modern version of gourds with candles in them. And there was, a, yeah, there was a lot more like stuff going on, like, as far as, you know, I mean, don't go, don't go too pagan because, um, you know, they would have multiple sexual encounters and stuff with a lot of people around this time of year, too. So, you know, uh, <laughs> So you, you, you don't want to go through it. Yeah. Um, I'm not entirely sure. I mean, it's kind of all year round for the most part, you know, but I celebrate that kind of thing. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, um, <laughs> Yeah, uh, no, um, there was, the only thing I was going to bring up, um, was early, it was, it was the first show, there was some guy, he, he was kind of going off about, like, the Canaanite demons, and, I don't know, it kind of rubbed me the wrong way, because it's like, you know, all, like, the Canaanites aren't around anymore, all right, they slaughtered them, uh, they took all the, Basically, everybody except for the women that haven't seen a husband or a man. Um, but that's where you get people like Baal, the god of rainstorms, Marduk, the um, the god of law, and I think he's commerce as well. And then, of course, uh, Yahweh, the god of metallurgies. So, I mean, yeah, I mean, it's just, I don't know. Whenever we, I mean, I'm, I was a, um, deliverance baptist um when i was religious and you just have to be really careful about sure so you know we obviously are familiar with king james um now as far as his other book uh he has a book called demonology where he goes into, and a lot of people just, you know, make up stuff on the spot. I mean, it's like statistics. 99% of them are just pulled straight out of you know what. But uh, basically, there's people that think that, you know, like mental illnesses don't exist. You just need to exercise them. Uh, and it's just like, no, you don't have a liver problem. It's just a demon you know, a demon of this, a demon of that, and it's just, you know, now, I mean, don't get me wrong, you know, people, whenever I'm talking, they'll be like, oh, yeah, there's a demon telling him what to say, you know, and of course, you know, I work with any, <laughs> anyway, no, I'm just joking, <laughs> but anyways, um, but especially what I've noticed with XJWs, um, yeah, he did not definitely, definitely did not worship the sun and Emperor Constantine. But anyways, uh, I'm not going to respond to chat. But no, I did not drop the C-bomb again, Bob Roberts. But anyways, uh, yeah, it, no, you're good. But yeah, and I've I've noticed with the XJW community, um, just you know, you guys are very vulnerable people, uh, and all of you guys suffer from religious trauma syndrome. As well, I think we heard that last week with uh, Mrs. Glass, uh, which was unfortunate to hear. Uh, a lot of things are tied into that, and that was not pretty. But um, yeah, I mean, I. I I can't really, you know, I mean, everyone's on a journey as far as the the healing goes. And 
uh, definitely just, you know, standards of evidence and epistemology and not and studying epistemology and, you know, not falling for schema. Because it's not only religion. I mean, I mean, it's, you know, like you can call up someone's grandma and, you know, have to steal all their money through Zell Pay with USAA, you know. So it, it's just kind of sad. I mean, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a white hat social engineer. So I'm not going to do anything bad, but, you know, I do like doing a little bit of engineering from time to time as far as, you know, just online and stuff. It's fun. Well, especially with the job that I have um, dealing with Kiba files specifically, which uh, people, we throw around the term pedophile a lot whenever we're talking about the Jehovah's Witness community but there's more to it. Pedophiles are just, that's a very young age bracket. Hebophiles are, I believe, in reference to like 11 to 14, and then you have like xenophiles. So it's always good to use the specific language just because you seem, you appear like you know what you're talking about, whether that's the case or not. And it sounds more convincing. I was, yeah, I was just gonna kind of co-host until you told me to beat it. But as far as the wedding rings go, um, I mean, it, I know that the Romans used them quite a bit. I mean, I think, which of course you know is, is involved with paganism and everything. And it's, just, it's such a broad term, too, because we could be talking about the Romans or we could be talking about people in caravans, you know, in Romania. I mean. Yeah, and then you have ancient paganism, which is in specific ties to uh, Egyptian culture. So, um, Ra, and then you have, well, you have so many different gods. I mean, you have crocodile gods and stuff, so... But as far as, um, oh, I, I forgot to mention, when I was talking about the Canaanites, the the people of Marduk Baal, they're considered the Elohim. And, and I study Christian nationalism a lot, so it's kind of refreshing listening to Rick and stuff, because uh, people get really... Yeah, so basically Third Reich, you know, think Third Reich. You have the, the you have Catholic right wing, you have just Christians that are wanting to take, you know, complete control, basically. And uh, it's definitely become more of a problem for sure uh, in recent, recent time. Um, if we're going to exclude El Duce, the Catholic, the Pope, and then, of course, you know, Hitler. Um, I also study geopolitics as well, so I'm not just, you know, blurting stuff out. But, uh, yeah, I remember, I can't remember the YouTube channel, but, yeah, they were, they were just going on and on about all these different gods and how they're demons and 
people don't understand that Christianity, it's not, or the Abrahamic religions, they're not, it's not monotheistic, it's a henotheistic religion. That's why in the first commandment it says, there shall be no other gods before me. It's just that Yahweh is the one that the Jews went into covenant with and, you know, said that, yeah, we're not going to pray to Baal, we're not going to, you know, pray to Marduk, and then, you know, and then uh, I, guess, I believe uh, El was the creator god, and you see actually ancient Jews, I think there was a turquoise mine in Egypt where a, a Jew was he carved saw, like a prayer for help into the side of a mine, uh, calling out to El, and that was the creator god for all the Elohim. But there's a hundred of them, uh, potentially more, but you know, Library of Alexandria, Fourth Crusade, you know. <laughs> so, and catch up with that here. Oh, for sure. And, it, and it's a process, too. I mean, you know, there are people that believe all different kinds of things. I mean, recently I've been studying Islam more than I really ever have, um, trying to, you know, talk with people, uh, just because I, I already know so much about Christianity and studied it for so long. It's like, there's not much of a point to really continue studying it like I have, unless it just it comes into play my my i guess most recently uh, with my thesis and everything i've been focusing more on china um mao zedong's little red book but the the christian nationalism but that's that's the main thing i don't know i know we have some australian viewers but you know if we were to look at the first amendment and then of course the actual author um of that amendment, Thomas Jefferson, and uh, uh, how he elaborated to the Baptist at Danbury, and then, of course, the Treaty of Tripoli in 1791, um, proclaiming that, of course, you know, again, that we're not a, we're not a Christian country, we're versing the Barbary pir pirates who were Muslim, and their entire thing that's why we went to we went back to england and we got so close with them again is because um yeah there's a lot of muslims that just they felt that they can go and murder and enslave and steal ships that aren't from any muslim countries um just because from of course their religion they, uh the archangel gabriel told muhammad that you know this is the last religion you know and the Jews and the Christians will join them, but of course that hasn't happened yet. If if at all, I don't I don't think it will. That, that's why whenever I hear, you know, this like one world religion in the past on the show, it's just like, I mean, guys, we we really got to study a little bit more. Like, there's there's no way that like stuff like Hinduism or even the Abrahamic religions are going to come together, you know. It, it's it's so vastly different that there's just no way. Yeah. Um, however, the the Communist Party of, of China is is just too strong. Uh, I, I mean, we the Korean War it, we never should have had a ceasefire. 
Yeah, it's very sad because there's there's a lot of just regular people in China that are, you know, just trying to live. And, you know, I mean, if we're going to be looking at the most religiously uh, oppressive place, I mean, it's definitely going to be China. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Falun Gong practitioners, but yeah, they're they're arrested and Harvard. Oh, uh, I think early 2000s. I mean, it's still going on. Like if you're a Falun Gong practitioner, yeah, you'll go to a re-education camp and potentially be, you know. But there, there's, but then of course you have the Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang, um, or Xinjiang. Um, and that's not very cool at all. Forced castrations and, but, you know, again, it's just the propaganda, you know, their indoctrination, you know, you convince somebody that Mao Zedong thought is the way to go, you know, you can commit all kinds of atrocities. Yeah. Um, no, I mean not, not, and not unless we're going to water down religion so much to where, you know, we just stop paying attention to them. But I mean, if you're actually looking at, you know, certain tenets of specific religions, it's just a no go. I mean, I think secularism has kind of definitely been dragging everybody from the dark ages. Um, over the past couple centuries, I mean, we see a definitely increase in science and technology, which is not a coincidence. And, you know, that's why we, we find it so appalling to see women walking around in, you know, fully black burkas and little girls being taken out of school and, you know, being married to, you know, older men and I, I mean the name of the game for a while for our species was just reproduction but at this point it's like unless you don't have, unless you have the cash for a kid you know you know it, it's best not to I mean you, you see all these different countries just but you know again we have lots of pandemics and stuff and natural disasters that help even stuff out but I'm sorry, say that again. Oh, I was talking about uh, in Afghanistan. Yeah, not necessarily. Uh, well, I, 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 well, there is cash involved, some kind of monetary exchange, but a uh, little girl used. Uh, yeah, I mean, little girls being sold in, you know, Islamic countries are just not allowed education, which is, you know, definitely very unfortunate. I mean, in the Quran, I can't remember the verse, but it says that if, a, if the woman has a question, uh, she just needs to go to her husband for the answer. And, of course, it's like, you know, I mean, I, I personally would rather find somebody that's smarter than me, um, a lot smarter. I'd rather just, you know, <laughs> use my hands to be honest with you. But, uh, well, yeah, I mean, if we're talking about genetics, there's just, you know, certain brain hardware and certain genetics that just give people more of an advantage. I mean, you know, being a, uh, a cauc yeah, being a Caucasian coming from the Caucasus mountain range, my genetics, you know, I'm predisposed to a genetic mutation where I can't process dairy products as well. So, you know, 
right on it. Yeah, I mean, I, so I'd like, you know, somebody who has, you know, a little bit more mixed genetics, you know, potentially some African or some Asian, and you have, you know, all these different other, you know, species like, you know, Denisovans and Neanderthals and stuff, like Denisovans in Asia and Neanderthals in Europe. But, you know, I mean, I'm not going to get too incredibly picky, but, you know, just, just little stuff like like that. I mean, I, I don't really think that technology is going to get to a point in my lifetime where I can live forever. But, you know, in 300 years, you know, our, our genetics are going to be so mixed on the North American continent that, you know, I mean, Caucasians are just, you know, it's going to be, it's definitely going to be hard to find somebody who's like, you know, full, you know, 100% Caucasian. Oh no, definitely not. I mean, like I said, I mean, we're we're talking about. I mean, even just look at the African American community. Okay, we so we've had six hundred thousand slaves brought over, five point five million in the Caribbean, and then five million just to South America. But obviously, the populations of African Americans, just considering that they are in the Americas, so there are technically African Americans. You know they're they're all gone okay but we're not going to go to that part of history right now but uh you know you have the intermingling you know so you have people walking around with 15 percent african-american the rest caucasian i mean you know there's but and sometimes you can't really tell you know and then you also have um of course hispanics and i mean it's going to take quite a while i i mean they're not going to, they're going to look at us like barbarians, to be honest with you, if they're, if technology continues to progress and nothing crazy happens in the world that ends our species. But, uh, you know, everyone talks about the end times coming and it's just like, guys, I mean, <laughs> Jesus said he'd back, he'd be back before the apostles came and he's not back yet. So, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you guys like 1914, 1975. I mean, I fell for the 2014 stuff and which is kind of embarrassing, but you know, yeah, no, uh, it, it was, a uh, Yeah. Yeah, no, you're good. Yeah, I mean, I was I was born into a Baptist household. Uh, my mother, my dad wasn't really uh, too crazy religious. Um, and yeah, when I was about 13, 14, um, just researched, studied, heard arguments, and just stop believing and 
any kind of God or religion ever since. And it's just been a journey of trying to understand why people believe certain things, how people become convinced. I don't know how to convince somebody. Uh, it's, it's a whole entire process for each individual person. I can't sit here and say one thing that's going to, you know, make everyone become secular and, you know, stop killing each other, you know, just random shit from, you know, sex and stuff. But, you know, I'm, I'm sure it's hell going to try. But, um, yeah, as far as the 2014, it was some Baptist preacher. There was some, anytime that people start doing math with the Bible, it's just kind of funny just to get to the end time predictions. So, but I don't know what this person's saying. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, I I wouldn't consider, I mean, Christianity is not a cult by any means, but I mean, any any religion could become a cult um, with specific denominations and tenets. And again, it's just these narcissists and, you know, people will use God as if they have some kind of special connection with him and only they can get the right answers. And they use it to just, you know, manipulate, gaslight, coerce people, their kids, their congregation into doing whatever they want. I mean, it, it's sad. And my fifth commandment says that do not give any kind of false prospectus. So don't try to scam people. Don't try to, you know, convince them of something for, you know, monetary gains. But, um, you know, I also yep. oh, I'm, I'm sorry, could you repeat that? I was reading um, what this person was saying in chat I, I i think that they're a troll to be honest with you but uh, yeah i mean i'm not going to come and you know contrary to what you guys used to believe i'm not going to be kicking down your door and taking you to prison camps i mean you know like if you want to, if you want to order train sets off Amazon and play with them in your house, that's fine. I'm not gonna. I don't care. I mean, I'm an American. Pursuit of happiness, all that fun stuff. But go ahead and ask that question again. I'm sorry. Yeah, and I, I listen to way too many pastors that just have, I don't know if you're familiar with Kat Kerr, but she she's like a commander. Huh? Okay, well, she's worth a, 
well, she calls herself a commander. She she believes that she's been taken to heaven multiple times, and she'll go on to all these podcasts and write curriculum for private Christian schools. She has a rain stick that she tried to knock hurricanes off. <laughs> You're like, just delusional. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is like this is a staff. This is like a, a staff, like Moses staff. Like she literally, like yeah, she like tries to cast the the hurricane off, like a spell. Like it's the weirdest thing. It's the weird. I'm sorry, but it's just like the. <laughs> like woo woo as far as like grandiose delusions talking about like like heaven because like like cat will go on about how there's like prosthetic limbs like stores like like warehouses at heaven that you can get to where you can have new limbs and do all this like, is that is that kind of yeah okay so yeah i mean i because honestly it's like there's not really that grave a description of heaven, and it's like, you know, people, and people it's like, no, it's, it's your show, so I was just wanting to hear what your response was, but yeah, it's the burden of proof is on the person making the claim, I mean, if, if I was trying to go around disproving every little thing, I mean, you know, that's, that's just not how it works. You know, like, you know, it's, it's just it's Hello? a famous court. Hello, mate. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. I've seen people like that before, the woo-woo people. And it's always like, oi, I can control the wind. And then you're like, hey, you're not controlling the wind. And they go, oh, I must be a little off today. And then a big gust of wind will come and they'll go, see? It's always like coincidental stuff that happens that confirms for them what's going on, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, no, there's there's nothing biblical about what they're about what she's saying. I mean, that that's the whole thing is that like you know people can go on these tirades about you know what heaven will be like, and you know I get it. I've I've lost people too, and it would be nice to think that I could see them again, but you know, and like like grandfather, but you know also at the same time too. I mean, I suffer from CAS, so, you know, it's just, I'm kind of stuck in the, 
the world that I belong to. And yeah, pe- people in chat, they haven't been listening. <laughs> They're calling me a Baptist when I've clearly stated that I'm not religious at all. I mean, I'm an American. I'm dedicated to preserving the religious freedoms of all citizens. But also, too, I have questions in the meantime. Cynical asshole syndrome. Yeah. Yeah, it's... Yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like, you know, anybody like, I mean, I'll talk to you, I'll talk to, you know, old people about religion just because they like talking to me and stuff. But, you know, I can also sit there and be like, okay, yeah, Joseph Smith is just a complete little, he, he, I mean, he's a cult leader. I mean, he, he specifically came up with that religion just to control people. He wanted a bunch of wives that he could just, you know, yeah. I mean, I, I've studied the Book of Mormon more than I've ever wanted to. Yeah, and if if we're talking like you know comparative religions, um, it's it's not even close to Christian. I mean, it's based on the same thing because obviously you can't sit there and you know bring out a brand new religion and expect people to believe it. But if I can convince you, you know that it, it ties in with the Bible, but. You know, our Constitution wasn't written in 500 A.D. They didn't have chariots. There was no battle with two million people that happened on the continent somewhere. And uh, no, it, it's just kind of awkward for me to be like, you know, talking with people who just clearly believe such delusional things and without coming off as extremely condescending um now i do not support mormonism at all because they're well in in the past there's a reason why they ended up in utah they there's a paper mill in illinois uh that they basically burned down because they wrote something slightly critical because i mean they, they were christians criticizing other christians so they weren't like mean or anything too terribly but yeah, the Missouri National Guard made sure that their whole crew was like not welcome in Missouri anymore. It's like the, it's like, yep, yeah, yeah, no jab needed. I, I'm not a Bible hater, but well, depending on whatever version you want to talk, but you wouldn't see me, you'd be hearing me. But anyways, um, <laughs> sorry, more that CAS coming out. Uh, oh yeah i mean i don't get i don't get too bothered bothered i mean you know i had a mother that was just you know absolutely horrible to me about religion so you know i've learned just to you know like if i'm not going to care what if she thinks I'm burning in hell for all eternity, what the hell do you guys think? I'm going to care about what you think about me. I mean, I've been paying attention to what people have been typing. And, you know, definitely a grasp on the English language would be, would suit some of some of the comments. Not in this chat, um, but shallow with no context. Well, Trudy, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, I still need your comment, that's all. Yeah. But.
Um, I can't, I honestly can't remember um, how he died, but I, I do know that he was, uh, I mean, he had a lot of court problems because he, he used to go out and he would use the same seer stones to find water on people's land and he would charge like hidden treasure and he would charge them. So, you know, eventually people got wise. Uh, but uh, I believe he was awaiting trial. He was awaiting trial in like a county jail at the time. And then the mob knocked him off. Um, as far as Jason goes, uh, yeah, if you were paying attention, I said that I was, I was, a, I grew up a Baptist, um, not around me. Yeah. I mean, I can speak to you directly. I don't care, but mainly only directed at the abusive, using, lying, and beastly. Yeah. I don't really know what this individual is talking about, but you know, it's like JW Fox, like Somebody was being kind of kind of mean to him, so I, I got onto that. I got onto that person, just like dude. Like this is why I don't really talk about my personal beliefs. Like whenever like Paul comes in, you know, she's she's older and she's she still has a, a husband that's a Jehovah's Witness, and it's just like you know, I'm always extremely nice to her. Ask how she's doing, all that fun stuff. Her name is like Paul Koth or something. Um, but good night, Jay. Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah. If you remember, um, I actually did research on you, so I know that people put the information out there publicly. So yeah, I'm familiar with what you're talking about. Yeah, I, I mean, you know, it just sounds like, you know, you're damaged at, you know, a, a young age. I mean, like a lot of people, um, you know, it, and it's not necessarily, you know, like all religions fault. I mean, it, it's the fault of you just mentally ill people, you know, but again, they use religion as a tool. I mean, pick, pick any religion, you know, and, or any denomination of, you know, Christianity. Um, and it's sad. And Angela, I agree. The, the she says, uh, no wonder the organization doesn't encourage uh, high level education because it opens the mind. And you know, 
And I, I, all I did was, yeah, I've just been to Al, to the Al Gore University. <laughs> yeah. No, it, it's a joke. It's just the internet. Yeah. I, I mean, you just study. Yeah. I mean, cultural anthropology is one of those things where you just have to sit down and study, you know? You just have to learn the material. Like, like right now, I'm trying to learn Python, and um, that that's something. Like, like Harvard has a bunch of free videos and stuff. So, I guess we could technically say that I'm kind of going to, you know, I'm watching Harvard videos for free. But I mean, information is out there. But. No, they have a specific, uh, well, my cousin sent me the link. He's the one that's kind of helping me. But he's been sending me links to, you know, Harvard classes. And, you know, it's just I'm not paying to go to school. But um, um, but let's see here. Jason, he says uh, he's in Canada, and he's troubled today about our suicide prompting governing body of Canada. Um yeah, I mean that's a that's one thing that um, you know that's definitely always rather unfortunate. I I would like to actually have some statistics as far as like what's the suicide rate of Christians of all denominations and see how high Jehovah's Witnesses are. But you know, again, that that's tying that's tying like suicide to Christianity in a way that's kind of unfair because. It's not Christianity, it's, you know, the governing body members. And it's always important to make that distinction just so we're not sitting here say, you know, coming off as like, oh, Christianity causes this, causes this. It's No, I mean, it's, it's people causing it, you know. People are the ones that are going to, you know, kick you out of the house at 14 and make take your life in a in a hotel when you're 23, you know. So, yeah, Bob, go ahead. Yeah, there's, again, like I said, I, I, I listen to a lot of preachers. I mean, they're they're always the batty ones because, you know, I mean, most regular preachers aren't, aren't too terribly interesting um, to study. Again, I, this is... Oh, interrupt me whenever, but... I do not, unfortunately.
Right. Right. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm definitely more of a George Carlin kind of guy as far as, you know, I'm just not as funny and I don't have millions of dollars. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. And, 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 you know, like one thing I've, I've, I've heard Rick talk about as well is just the amount of, yeah, Trudy says they don't believe half of what they teach, and that's, that's definitely probably true, if not more so. But uh, um, let's see here. Um, what is it? Uh, God, I lost my train of thought. But, oh, the money aspect. I mean, just thinking about how much, you know, money. I, I, I know Rick's been in for a while, but it's like, just pick anybody. If you put that money into an interest-bearing account for yourself, how much good you can do in the world because Jesus, he, there wasn't really a, a lot of understanding of wealth creation methods like we do today, you know, back, you know, in that time, definitely not, you know, the, the ancient Jews wouldn't, I mean, you have the Romans and stuff, but, you know, the, the Jews were really just living there and being ceremonial, but I mean, how much good that money could do as far as just and not being gluttonous. I mean, just because I don't believe or nothing, that doesn't mean I'm gluttonous. That doesn't mean I go, you know, sleeping around. Um, there's, there's lots of secular reasons not to do that kind of stuff. Um, Yeah, and I mean, if we're going to be looking at this, our, the history of our species, I mean, you know, we make love, not war. I mean, just kind of in general, I mean, as far as like with each other, I mean, there's there's been a lot more love making than there has been war. Um, and, you know, that's why uh, we're able to become so successful. Yeah, I, I mean, in recent times, yeah, but as far as word making, I mean, again, if I can convince you, you know, of X, I can convince you to get on a boat and go off to a far distant land and, you know, cut people down with swords, you know. I mean, it's just, it's something that's just innate in us. It's very natural. It sucks. Hopefully it will stop eventually. But, you know, when we have these conflicting ideas, um, I mean, it does seem, it, it, it's not a, a a bad thought to think that, you know, money is, that it's a money-making machine because it is. Okay. I mean, my great-grandfather, after he got done fighting in China, um, you know, working on P-40s and flying them and stuff, you know, he was working for Lockheed Martin, okay? And that's a big, <laughs> that's a big company. I mean, people, people who like money go to where the money is and, you know, 
But even without it, I, I mean, we'll always need weapons. We'll always need guns. I mean, I'm going to get my federal, federal firearms license with my class three experimental so I can be building suppressors and integrated barrel suppressors and all this kind of stuff legally without going to jail for, you know, 30 years. But, um, yeah, it's definitely a mistake to say that because, you know, it's like Russia, you know, going to war with Ukraine. And, oh, and that's another thing. Uh, a lot of televangelists and a lot of people, uh, I guess, who are, I hate to call them pastors, but, um, yeah, they've, they've been supporting Russia because they're they're Christians as well. Uh, but it's been kind of discussed. But anyways, you know, a lot of that. Yeah. It, yeah, and you know, it, you know, if we blockade the Black Sea, Russia will starve. So, you know, there is interest in actually trying to secure Ukraine for Russia, but obviously lying about going to war is not the best way. I mean, we've done it. I mean, I've learned things about our country that make me sick to my damn stomach. And it's just like, I. it's horrible. I mean, I'll try to run for governor when I turn 31. That's kind of the plan. Uh, the the Federalist Party, but again, no, nobody. I, I mean, it's a two party system now, and I, I don't think anybody. It's, it's the oldest uh, political party in the United States, but um, uh, but yeah, I mean, I I would definitely disagree. I mean, guns are definitely an answer. Uh, no jab. They're definitely an answer. I mean, that's, I've had to use them before. Uh, it's not fun. Um, but, I mean, that, that's angry much life. No, I mean, I'm not, I'm not too terribly angry. I just, I mean, I just don't like wicked people. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Now, I do get angry sometimes whenever I'm thinking about, like, the amount of cartels and stuff in the United States. But, yeah, I mean, like I said, it, you know, I, I mean, I've wrote research social engineering enough and, you know, manipulators and I've had firsthand experiences with them. I've had to get orders of protection against them. I prosecuted them. I've caught them, so, yeah, I mean, I recognize all the little tips and tricks. It's just, you know, if you're going to try that kind of stuff, at least try harder, you know. I'll, I'll appreciate a better effort. But, um, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, like, I, I've had problems with people. Like, I don't mind people, like, you know, poking my buttons like uh, – um, you know, Jason uh, did before, but that honestly could have been just a, a simple misunderstanding because these these topics are hard to talk about. And he, I don't think he was trying, he was just wanting to make sure that I was addressing him properly, which, you know, I always will. And, you know, if there's always miscommunication, I want to, I want to clear it up for sure. Because, 
that's not who I am. Like, well, you know that for a fact because, I mean, I I almost got banned last week for using. You know. Yeah, uh, but you know, <laughs> but how sorry can I be? <laughs> oh, well, I appreciate and enjoy you. That's definitely for sure. Um, you know, but one tactic I have been doing is just, you know, taking screenshots of what people have been saying just so, you know. I had an issue with a person a real long time ago, and I saw her in chat earlier, and she was making fun of, like, <laughs> she, like, straw-manned me. Like, I, I had no idea what her problem was, but she, she extrapolated something that, like, I was not even close to saying, and I, it wasn't even the same, the same state. And I told her, I was like, you know, if you want to straw-man somebody, you know, go to Home Depot and buy one for like 30 bucks and talk to it in your room. I mean, and and then she started going off about how my mommy pays for my phone and all this. Like, wow. Like, yeah. But, you know, again, these manipulation tactics, they're not only in the watchtower, they're everyday people. And it's just, the sooner that you can recognize it in your personal life and take steps to counteract that. Now, I know not everybody's going to have my personality type to where I like to confront people. But, you know it gets fun after a while because you get used to it. I mean, but that's all I can say, you know. Um, uh, correct. Yes. Epistemology, logical fallacies. Basically, it's like, hey, Linda, why do you think it's okay? Like, like, why do you think it's okay to beat your kids? That's a complete straw man. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's like if we look at the comments section, no jab needed. Um, I'll get to your comment, Trudy. I'm sorry for skipping over you, but you know, for example, she says Bible haters 100%. I mean, that's a complete straw man right there because. I mean, although I don't necessarily like to sit there and read the Bible as much anymore, just because, you know, I mean, 
like there's other stuff to study. Like Mao Zedong's little red book has been much more on my mind than any kind of religious text recently. But, uh, you know, if you use a fallacy, you can dismiss that person very easily. So if you're going to be fallacious and not rehabilitate yourself, then that's when you go into dismissing people and categorizing them and your mind is, okay, I shouldn't care what this person has to say anymore uh, about that particular topic. But uh, as far as, uh, let's see here, Trudy Z, she says, it's sad how many lose their faith in God and Yahweh after leaving the watchtower. Um, eventually their faith was in the potentially um let's see world um the lies constructed by the organization potentially i mean but yeah i mean you know because that's true like you know when people lose their faith in god their whole entire idea of the afterlife and stuff goes with it generally um, well, I wouldn't say generally, I'd say a lot of people still believe, or some people would still believe, well, no, no, I think that it, it basically much goes for everybody. Um, it was their belief in God, but, you know, I mean, it's, just, it's hard for me to sit here and, you know, force people to believe or not to believe in things, although the opposing party would probably like that <laughs> like to do that for sure is this, a, is this an open conversation yeah on, buddy. Yeah, yeah this is dan how you guys how you guys doing tonight hi i've been just listening and doing a little commenting in the chat but yeah, I, I, I just want to say I, I think everybody's got to figure it out for themselves. I mean, you know, if I was to tell somebody my journey, it wouldn't probably make any sense to anybody else because I had to turn over my own rocks. And when I came out of the witnesses, you know, I was able to ask, like, really crazy questions like, did God know it was going to fall? And uh, they say, oh, oh, God, man is screwed up. Man is bad. Man is this. Woman is this. And I say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You, you said God is all-knowing, Alpha and Omega, that he knew it was going to fall. And if he knew it was going to fall, why would he create something that was going to fall? Did he know all this bloodshed and everything was going to happen? Well, if you say he's Alpha and Omega, then he would. Then he intended it to fall. He knew it was going to fall. But, you know, people go, no, 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 no. They'll, they'll make the Bible right. But then when it fell, then it said, Satan said, you'll become like God, knowing good and evil. So I say, what does it say down in verse 21, Genesis? It says they became like God, knowing good and evil. So I said, did Satan lie? And then it said on the day they're eating of it, it would die. And then after they ate, they became like God, knowing good and evil. Is that bad? I don't know. But then it says, oh, what should we do? As if, you know, Jesus and Jehovah were having a conversation. And what happened? Oh, don't let them get to the tree of life. Whoa, whoa, whoa. It said the day you're eating of it, you'll positively die, not live 999 years. So in those questions, they have to say there's a conundrum in Revelation. But, you know, after traveling, I've been out 20-some years, and after being in like 200 different religions, every one of them have a tapestry. Seventh-day Adventist, they stay in the Torah. You know, Christianity stays in the New Testament. It's all about Jesus. You know, anybody who doesn't, you know, fall on their knees is going to be genocided. Anybody who don't follow Jehovah is going to be genocided. Whoever doesn't follow Allah is genocided. You know, Muslims, you guys worship the mediator. We worship Allah. And it's interesting. I, I just wonder, here, here's, a, here's a thought to contemplate. Who knitted together me and you and the Muslims and the Tibetan Buddhists in the womb? Who called them forth? Who called them forth? Who immaculately conceived them? You know, how could they be any other way? 
if you were born in Israel, there's four different religions over there. Maybe you were born in a good one. Maybe you were born in a good Muslim one. So how can we say they're wrong other than belief systems? So I, I often wonder what happens if the belief systems of separation, if we really thought about it and thought, hey, he breathed the same air. Hey, he was immaculately conceived like I was. Um, he, he was born here. He was called here. He was born on the other side of the world, another religion, another idea. But I wonder what would happen if we all of a sudden just realized, you know, we all breathe the same air. We all, you know, live from the same sun, eat from the same ground, drink the same water, and left the belief systems aside, you know, that somebody has to die because they don't believe like us. And that's what we were taught as, as witnesses. You know, genocide was to come to anybody who didn't know the name of Jehovah, only, right? And so it was the same in Christianity. I got to tell you, when I, when I went around, it was the same thing. And then there were 200 sects of Christianity, you know, charismatic, this, that, the other, Old Testament, New Testament, there's healing, no healing. And I was like, whoa. So, you know, I just figured out that nobody could bring me salvation, which is understanding, but me. So that's what's kind of cool, I think, is, you know, that it's okay for people to be different because everyone was born into a different environment, different education. Some have education. I never had education. I had to go out and find, turn over my own rocks. And I did spend time in Seventh-day Adventist, Mormonism, Buddhism, Scientology, Science of Mind, all of them. And Hinduism and Buddhism and Paramahansa and Yogananda and mysticism and all that stuff. And it was a beautiful, it was beautiful. It was turning over rocks. And I got some gems out of all of them. And because I was in them, mentally, didn't make me bad. I just turned over rocks. I just looked at them. I just examined them closely. And I came up with my own tapestry. And I really think eventually, over time, we're all going to have to find our salvation through our own study. Because I don't think anybody can give it to us. You know what I'm saying? I think it's our responsibility, you know, to Just some thoughts to kick around. How old were you Mormon, Dan? I, I wasn't a Mormon long. I wasn't a Mormon long. In fact, I just visited Mormon. I really wasn't a Mormon. I live in Mormon country right now. And I know I know mm. some of the tapestry. I don't know the whole thing about all the stuff that goes on in their temples. I've been in their temple. I've <clears throat> I know some of it about, you know, they, they talk a lot about covenants and doctrines and you know that you know, God would never leave us without a prophet. And the testimony that they have a prophet was the Book of Mormons that was given to, I don't know, Joseph Smith through Moroni. You know, so they have a tapestry of scripture. So when you talk to Mormons, all you hear about is the tapestry of covenants and doctrines and the fact that they have a prophet. That's the main study because I've been in their study groups. And in their study groups, they have a big, beautiful room with massive pictures of the prophets on the wall. And the study that you go into in the study is the study of the prophets and why God would never leave us without a prophet and why we're the only church that has the true prophet and God didn't leave us without a prophet today. <clears throat> Other than that, I don't know much more about them. And, you know, I, I don't really want to know much more about them. I don't need to know. When I got in there, I realized and I recognized it was just somebody taking a few, you know, chapters out of the Bible and making a religion out of it. I think Jehovah's Witnesses take, I don't know, I've heard a hundred and some scriptures out of the Bible and they make a religion and it's all based around Jehovah's name. You know, the Seventh-day Adventists are all about the Torah and the Ten Commandments and keeping the Sabbath. And they don't trust anybody who don't keep the Sabbath. If you don't keep the Sabbath, they don't want to hear anything. The Bible says keep the Sabbath. And, you know, so on and so forth. But the Bible says a lot of things in a lot of areas, just depending where you want to focus in on the Bible. And so the Bible, to me, has caused a lot of schizophrenia. You know, Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus said, Father, forgive, they don't know what they're doing, why they were piercing them through. You know, Jesus shows up in front of Paul, you know, who's killing people. You know, a lot of the messianics and things say, well, you know, you've got to earn your way. You've got to keep the law. You've got to do this. Well, what law was Paul keeping when he was killing Christians when Jesus showed up? And it just, 
it's kind of a conundrum. I really think, you, you know, you really got to knock. You know, I don't know if you guys believe in the Holy Spirit, but I, but I believe the Holy Spirit will sort out the scriptures from the ideology. I think religion has made God a man. I don't think God should have a name. I know people call him Yahweh and stuff. I don't care if it's in the Bible, but I don't think you give a spirit a name that has no beginning, no end. I think if you give a spirit a name like they have, you can make them a man and you can make them jealous and angry and vicious and all these things, which I don't believe God is. And it's the same with Jesus. I think that was why the big push was to make Jesus God so you could make him a man and that everyone would worship him as if he wanted worship, as if Jesus was a narcissist. You know, everyone's got to fall on his knee and, and worship. He came here for that. That's what Jesus came here to do. You know, so there's a lot of misunderstanding in, in my perspective. That's just my my understanding where I'm at right now on my yeah. journey. You know, that's, that's all. Yeah, Sharon. And- Dan, uh, as far as, like, the whole, uh, you know, if we look at, like, Jesus being caught, I mean, he he very easily could have escaped. I, I mean, he, know that the, he knew that, you know, the Romans and stuff were, you know, were after him as far as, you know, going around and, you know, saying that you're the king of the, well, I believe Pontius Pilate um, first said he was the king of the Jews, but... You know, I mean, he he did have chance to escape. So, I mean, I really think that he he did believe that you know when he was crucified, he was accepting all of our all of the uh, the sins uh, for mankind to escape salvation. But I mean, I'm one of those guys who are like, I mean, if I do something wrong, you know, I mean, I'll pay for it. You know, if I hit your car, I'm not going to have somebody else pay for it. <clears throat> Right. And that's why I think in, right. in some ways we're under we're under law. I mean, if we go out and screw around on our wife, we pay for that. You know, I don't think there's some time period where we're going to stand up in front of God and, and confess our sins. I really don't. I believe we pay for them now. If I'm an alcoholic, which I was, I paid for a lot of my debts and what I've done uh, being in alcoholism. God helped me out. You know, and the other thing, too, if you know, we were talking about the woo-woo, you know, that a lot of Christianity and spirituality has a lot of woo-woo, but but I I was thinking, you know, Jesus had a lot of, you know, I don't know if you guys believe he walked on water, he turned fish to bread or multiplied the fish and fed the masses and healed the sick and raised the dead. And he said his apostles did the same thing or or his disciples did the same thing. But what's interesting about what Jesus said is he said, do not marvel at what I'm doing because these things in greater you will do. And I think, you know, that's kind of woo-woo. And so what do we do with that? Do we throw that out and, and keep him as the savior, but throw out the fact that, you know, that we can't pr- produce the woo-woo. We, we're not here to do the greater things either. You know, he said too, he said, as I'm in union with the father and the father's in union with me, that you would come into union with us. And I believe that's the Godhead. I believe that's where the power comes from. And I believe that as we're related to the power, I believe we came in the same way. We were immaculately conceived. I don't believe we have a beginning, and I don't believe we have an end. I mean, where did I come from? Was I sitting around in a womb for 100 years, 1,000 years? Was I sitting in some female womb with my mother? Or was I called forth from some other place? You know what I mean? And then I came in here, this beautiful baby that's smiling and happy, and joyous, knowing no separation. And then I grew up in the Jehovah's Witnesses, and I learned that God's angry and jealous and mad, and I'm no good, and I'm junk, and I'm crap, you know, and, and I have this one Savior that has to come save me. You, you know what I'm saying? And it, it, it's like the, the wrong start, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, Kicking stuff around. I'm not trying to put anybody wrong. I'm just saying these are things I kicked around because I've always thought that would be great. I've always wanted to find that divine union. You know, Paul talked about it. Now you got to look into the scriptures. If you read about Paul, he talked about the Christos. Nobody knows what the Christos is. They think that's Jesus's last name. The Christos was the anointed of God. 
It was the anointing, right? It was the spiritual dimension that was in Jesus. That's why he was called Jesus of Christ. And that same Christ, he said, could reign in us. And that's why Paul said, the Christos in you, hope of glory. The Christos, the Christ in you, hope of glory. Not Jesus, the man, but the anointing in you, hope of glory. And that's why they said to Paul, where do you get this power? Where do you get this this?" these thoughts, where do you get this intuition? Where do you get this strength and, you know, and all this stuff? And he said, oh, how I labor till Christos, or oh, how I labor or travail till Christ be born in you. And they do not teach this in the church. And I believe the reason they don't teach it in the church is because they want powerless, dumbed down people. And I've been in a lot of them. I've been in 200 churches and the people are lost. There's, they're as lost as the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're waiting like Jehovah's Witnesses. This life sucks. This life is horrible. This life is bad. And here Jesus saying, I can't see you can have life and have it and have it more fully. And God said, what well, at the beginning, I made it good and it's very good. So how do we go from very good to junk? And why am I junk? Because God knew it was going to fall. And if God knew it was going to fall, why did he know it was going to fall? What was the intention for me being born into a fall? If I'm to just wake up, you know, in a church and think I'm junk and try to work backwards from that. So anyway, it's been an interesting thing. So I don't believe I'm junk anymore. I believe I'm made in the image and likeness of God. I believe I'm something wonderful that's going to unfold in some unique wonderful way that's a facet of God, just like every flower and tree and everything out here in nature that's beautiful. And I'm going to unfold the same way if I can get out of religiosity, if I can get out of the harnesses of churches who want me to be controlled, who want me to be manipulated, who want me to follow pastures, you know, and, you know, and these different things. It's a beautiful thing to be outside of that. You know, and I think I think part of our deal is stripping away falsehood. You know, I think like nature, right? We, you guys were talking earlier, and I'll just say a couple more things. But, you know, you guys were talking earlier about uh, the holidays and all that, you know. And, and I was thinking, this, man, I've had to strip away all the paganism that religion, that my religion put on a light bulb. You know, that it's pagan, it's satanic, it's this, it's that. You know, if a guy goes out in nature, sits there and meditates a little bit and prays, oh, my God, he's worshiping nature. You know, he's not in church. And i got to tell you guys something. Yeah. I've been in a lot more, a lot of churches, and I still drop in just to see how nutty they are. And I was yeah. in this hey, church last week. Yep, go ahead. Do you, do you know, it's real quick, and you'll get back, but you, do you know the verse yeah. about where uh, Jesus says not to babble like pagans? And then you see the contrast of like the pastures and stuff of today babbling like pagans. Yeah, yeah. Okay, continue. Well, they're they're throwing people out of the church. I'm going to tell you something. I went into a church and I was so mad because why shouldn't we be able to study? The Bereans did. Why can't we walk into a Buddhist thing and say, what the hell is this all about? What are they all sitting around here doing? What are they doing? What are, where are they trying to get? Where are they going? What's, what, well, what are they trying to connect with? They're trying to steal their minds. They're, they're trying to get out of race consciousness. Race consciousness is the consciousness that is made up of what our parents taught us, our religions taught us, that you know, political politics has taught us, all this separation. So Buddhism a lot is meditating and getting still and slowing down the race mind in, in a way to make room for, for divinity to come in. It's kind of like a book, right, that's, that's filled. There's no room for a divine idea. There's no room for nothing else. You know, I have all the answers. But I think I've spent so much time, most of the time I've spent after I've come out of witnesses is stripping away religiosity that's told me I was no good, that's, that's told me I was limited, that told me, you, you know, that, that, you know, I've been told in churches, just go and sit. You just need to come in here and you just need to heal. And I've been in other churches where they said, by God, this is the word. And if you go out there, let me tell you something. If you hear the word mysticism, run. If you hear the word spirituality, run. And you hear, and this guy's yelling. These guys are yelling. I was in two churches, Angela's Daughter's Church. And, and don't study. Same thing, guys. Think about it. 
don't study, don't think, don't turn over any rocks, don't get smart, don't get educated, don't expand your mind, live in a limited, narrow-minded view of Christianity or, or Jehovah's Witness or Buddhism. I think all of this stuff, honestly, I think we got to transcend it all. I think we got to strip away. God is not Buddha. God is not Jehovah. God is not Jesus. God is not... God is the all in all, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, nameless. I am. That's what God is. And, and, and what's interesting. Studied, yes. You, okay, real quick. Uh, have yeah. you studied Sikhism yet? And then continue on. Because what you're, what you're talking No, no, about, I haven't. I haven't studied. I've heard of it, Sikhism, but I haven't really okay. studied it. Is there something some in, interesting? Yeah, what you were just talking about makes me think of like what they think God is. It's just this like universal force that um, they believe in reincarnation, where if you do bad things, you come back around until you go into the universe of consciousness. But yeah, it's you, you definitely like learning about Sikhism. But go ahead. yeah, I, I just like looking at it all. I, I do. I like Zosterism. I, I like a lot of things. I just like turning it over. Because it's refreshing, and and I can actually operate outside the boxes. I don't have to be in anybody's boxes. And you know what's beautiful? If I don't have to be in anybody's boxes, I don't have to have you in anybody's boxes. Somebody can say, I'm a Christian, and I'll say, man, God bless you. Are you happy? Yes. God bless you even more. And a witness, whatever. Because Have you been to Montana yet, Dan? No, I haven't. Have you been to Idaho? Yes, I live in Idaho. Oh, well, then you know God. All you got to do is go outside and look up. <laughs> if you live past the matrix, you're there, babe. I, I know, you know, and that's the thing. Why I can't look at God and see all the variety, see all the different plants, all the different animals, all the different fidges, and say, why couldn't there be all kinds of different religious ideals? You know, I mean, America was supposed to be one nation under God you know, come here and worship. It wasn't really a Christian. It was, it was a, it was a, you know, sort of Bible based, but it wasn't like you had to worship Jesus. It was in God we trust. America was founded on God we trust, which means you could come here and worship as you will. It was all men, all women. You made it. You're there. The thing is here on the East coast, there's so many people that haven't been out where you've been. Once you're out there, you, all you got to do is go outside, sit in the yard, and you're in a church. It's That's God's right. Church. There, you're right, but you know, there is a church on every corner. There's a Mormon church, literally, on every corner, not even a mile apart. There's a Mormon church. Motto, our first motto was E Pluribus Unum, which is Latin for out of many one, and God we trust was added in the 1960s in a response to the fear of communism and the kind of the beginning of Christian na or rising of Christian nationalism again. But yes, go ahead. I I, I want to go up to Montana. I, I, yeah, I was wanting to live there for, for a very long time. Yeah, it's beautiful. The climate, the, 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 the uh, climate is beautiful here. We don't have much of a winter. It's uh, very dry. So when it's cold, it, it doesn't feel real cold. Like if it's 30 degrees, it feels like 45. And so it's kind of really nice like that. But, you know, I've, I've been so healed just walking in nature. I've been so healed just not thinking so much. You know, we, religion, I think, tries to keep us in our head, processing all the time. And I think that's what's been refreshing to me, to, to have a Buddhist understanding that I can just sit still which is also a mystical understanding, which is based on like the cloud of unknowing that you sit with the Lord in silence without any thoughts. And you allow the divine position to, to come in and, and, and do its handiwork on you. And so instead of you telling God what to do, the spirit knows what to do. You're, you're being acceptable. But I, but I've loved that part of Buddhism where I just don't have to process so much. I don't even know if what I'm thinking is true. And that's okay. It doesn't, have to, it doesn't have to have a name. You know, you look yeah. at some of the Native American beliefs and just a little bit of drumming and a powwow. It didn't have a lot to it. Now, there's a book called Blackfoot Physics that I have not read yet. Um, 
So some of the, their understanding of the cosmos was modern and vast in, compared to what the West has. I mean, I mean, Western philosophy has. But when you get to the American West, it takes your breath away. You don't, you don't need words. You don't need uh, dogma. You're just out there living and breathing. You're in the environment that's connected to everything. You look up and you see the sky and it's, yep. you're there. You're there with the creator. Yes, that's right, uh, Pixie. That's exactly right. That's all I can say. I just figured that I've been resurrected from religion. I've been resurrected from politics. Don't call me a left. Don't call me a right. Don't call me anything. You know, don't call me anything religiously. I don't want the labels. I don't want any labels on me. Don't tell me I'm a Christian. That's a limitation. That's narrow mindedness. You know, from what I've seen from, you know, in other people, they live from that, you know, but I live from Jehovah's Witnesses 40 years. I lived out of that ideology. I knew everything. And then guess what happened, guys? It collapsed. What collapsed? Belief systems. What happens when the belief system collapses? I expanded. I was born again. I was born again into a greater understanding. And that's what I think Jesus meant when he said death, resurrection, ascension. He said, you're going to die to be resurrected and ascend. You're going to come out of the tomb of unknownness, which I did, which is, was religion. Yeah, you know, I was a Jehovah's Witness living from a partial reality, not a whole reality, not totally wrong, but I was living totally as if that was real. It was done unto me as I believe. But then I realized, so is the Mormon. He's doing unto him what he believes, and the Hindu is doing unto him what he believes. And isn't that an interesting thought? I'll just throw this out. Isn't that an interesting thought that God, everybody, Yeah, yeah, I was just saying, uh, isn't it interesting that God, you know, we're told that we were knitted together in the womb, right? Well, why would God knit Muslims together in the womb? Why would God knit them together? And why would he immaculately conceive them? They wouldn't get, get here on their own. They were here before here, too. They had to be. They weren't in some womb and a bunch of seeds. What, what did God do, pull out of a million seeds, one seed? So if we ask these questions, to me... It expands the mind. Why is God pulling Tibetan monks out of the womb? And they're just up in these mountains meditating. Who are they? they got to be demonic. They don't believe like <laughs> you, know, you know what I mean? You know what I mean? <laughs> and the Tibetans are related to the Navajo. Oh, wow. That's very interesting. That's very interesting. So they all had boats. We are all one as humans, and we're so divided by the borders and the things that cause war and trouble. We're all just humans. Yes. And you know something, Pixie? And guys, you know what I see myself as? You. I see myself as you. How can I be any different than you? I was brought here like you. I came through a womb like you. I was knitted together like you by the hand of God. I was brought here for some particular purpose. You know what I mean? When I see me, I see you. I don't care what religion you are. I think that's what God does with our mind as we start shedding, as we start surrendering the illusions. Well, I'll tell you one of the best questions I ever said to God. Give me the truth. He says, put on a seatbelt. Put on that's right that's right and you know what it's never stopped and you know what's happening what i know keeps reducing i know i'm talking a lot but really what i know keeps reducing i don't have to know i don't have to know it i don't I can love you. I can love you. 
if I have a belief system, a very strong belief system, how the hell can I love you? If I think you ought to be like me, a Christian, or you're dead, can I really get to know you? Can I really get to know you? They talked about that on Rick's show. You know, you know, when, when, when you're a Jehovah's Witness, you know, all those Jehovah's Witnesses moving up to that area. Those people are going to look at the witnesses and the witnesses are going to look at them as indifferent, just like those Jews that are going to be up there, you know, those Hasidic Jews, right? They're going to monastery area. Yeah, but, but you, you guys know what I mean? You're, you're gonna, yeah, I do. Yeah. Imagine, imagine if I could look at you in the eye, truthfully, and say, you're me. I love you because I love me, because I don't have any judgment against myself. You know what I mean? God loves but that's me. But that's camping that's See, I thought the witnesses were going to promote camping for about five minutes because once in a while they'll have a picture of somebody camping or they had that video one time where they showed the stars and said, oh, here's the stars. Well, they quit having all this nature stuff because <laughs> once you get out there, you don't, you don't need dogma. You don't even, and you know, I'm such a reader. I don't even need a book when I'm out there. Good point. I never thought of that. Anything to do with anything. And I think Jeff brought up last week, the reason they don't want you at a, at a uh, Thanksgiving with your family is because you might feel some love from people. You might. And, hey, once you're out there, all you need is a nice little house, a nice fire, and a coffee cup. You don't, you don't need all the stuff we have here in the East Coast. All the stuff right. you go into. Be into yes. And I can tell you that, I, I'll tell you what, last week, you can ask Angela, I said, I feel like we got to get out of here. We got to get out. We got to get out. We got to get out. We got to see the leaves blowing around. We got to look at the different things. Didn't I, Angela? Yeah. I was like, we got to get out. We got Every day I just had to get out. And you know what? When I went out, I was rejuvenated. I felt whole. I felt complete. And like you said, Pixie and you guys, there was no book. There's no book that, that could do that. It was nature. It was the sun beating on my face. It was the, the breeze blowing on my face. Like we nature is the book. You guys look 10 years younger when I saw that last video where you were tanned after going to Shasta. I said, they got it now. <laughs> they got it. They found it. Shasta is an interesting place, I got to tell you. I mean, yeah. I heard yeah. Hey, can I say something? Yeah. Oh man, I heard my voice echoed there. I hate the sound of my own voice. Um, so I'm Brad from Australia, but I was actually born in New Zealand, and I'm a native of New Zealand. We call them Maoris. Uh, the religion that you're describing is what they believe. So one of the things I was going to comment earlier is when you said, "Oh, meditating in nature." They're going to make you think that you're worshipping nature. That is the specific reason why my father, Jehovah's Witness father, took away all our Maori culture from my mum. She's classed as Maori royalty, and um, that religion is classed as, what, pagan, spiritism, worshipping nature, that sort of stuff. But really what they believe in is that all, everything in the world uh, living or non-living is all connected. It is. And we can never, we can never be fully happy unless everything and everyone is fully happy. So if my, if my neighbor is not happy with something, then I have to go, for me to be happy, I have to go and help my neighbor get his happiness back. Otherwise, um, we can never all be happy together. And if we're treating the earth like shit, then we can never be happy because the earth is not happy. And that just love that, that you say of look, looking into Pixie's eyes and saying, we are one, that is, they have this thing where they, uh, they call sharing breath and they'll touch their foreheads and noses together and they'll stay there for a full breath. It's called sharing breath and it's the same. It's a way of looking oh. into someone's soul and telling you that we're the same. We have wow. the same mission, 
we have the same idea of life and that's for all of us to be happy. We can't ever all be happy unless all of us are happy. We're all connected. And that sounds very close to what you're describing. And it's a beautiful way of thinking, in my opinion. Yeah. I'm moving more and more into it. I, I, I really am. I, the wars hit me today. I thought, oh my God, we've been killing ourselves our whole life. We've been killing mm-hmm. each other ah, over religion, over different things, you know, oil, you know, but it's like we've been living in insanity. You know, we met somebody well, put it down to a war over a difference of opinion. We're killing each other over a difference of opinion yeah. that we can never prove. It definitely sounds ridiculous when you think about it like that. Yeah, you know, you know, some we met some people on a on a little boat. We were going to some islands up in Washington, and they were a whole different religion. I don't know. They kind of looked Indian. I don't know what they were. Angel sleeping, but they were the nicest people. And you know what they said? That we were in some religion that believes we're all one, and they said, "What religion is that?" They go, "Oh, it's massive." And I said, "I've never heard of it." Now I don't remember what it is. What is it? It wasn't Hindu. It was kind of a Hindu. It might have been like Sikhism. What is it? Might have been Sikhism. I think it was. You know something? Here's what's interesting. We knew they loved us, and we loved them. And they were strangers. We were coming back on the boat. We're like, we love you guys. We love you too. We embraced. We had some coffee. We talked the whole time. And guess what? There was no religion between us. There was no, I'm right. I believe this. I believe. It's just all belief systems anyway. Love is beyond belief systems. Love is what it, took me out of the cult. It goes a little deeper even than that from an anthropological point of view. What Brad has mentioned from his direct ancestors that he knows in this life by name is something that's done in the Nordic and Eskimo cultures to this day. I had a notion to do a graduate thesis of dancing around the world, of indigenous primitive dancing. And I looked for footage, and I looked for footnotes, and I realized there's probably not a university in the United States that would even grant me that. These these were the thoughts that were beat out of people, my dear friends. Hmm. Wow. That's amazing. The love and truth, natural human choreography was nearly beaten out of not just me, but millions of people before any of us were even born. Wow. Wow. I think all of this is part of the false reality that we're needing to shed so that we can come together. And I believe we can come together. And I believe there's going to come a time where we're going to get tired of killing each other over religion, over belief systems. I don't think belief systems are that important. They change all the time. If we could just breathe and dance and have a cup of coffee together, the world would be a great place. Isn't that so true? We go camping. We see people. We talk to people by the shore. They're fishing. We show them how to fish. They talk to us about this. I mean, we don't. There's nothing. There's nothing there that I'm. You know, it's not like when we were witnesses, we had to have a pack of, of uh, brochures. I'm really enjoying your guys' thoughts tonight. Um, it, it's amazing. I'm, I'm learning some things about some other religions. That guy from Australia, wherever he's from, too. That that is so amazing. What he said. You know, that, that kind of thing. that happened in his family. Well, Brad's just some kind of wonderful anyway. Yeah. That's a lovely thing to say, Pixie. Thank you. I was just saying bye to everybody. I, I got to go. Have a great evening. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great guy. Great guy. Good cop. I like him. Yeah, 
Yeah, it's called Amazon. You can get it at Amazon. It's called Inspirations of Christmas. You can get it on Spotify, Inspirations of Christmas. And I, and I got to tell you guys, there was so much love put into that. You have no idea. Angela didn't think we, we could have the money to make a, a CD like that. She says, I don't think we have the money. And I said, why don't you think we have the money? We have money for me and to write books and different things. Why wouldn't we have money for you? And she said, really? We can do a CD? And I was like, absolutely. And you know what? This girl can hear music. And this girl, she hired the very best players. Who are all the people you have, Angela? I don't know. She's sleeping. She, she hired a choir, a children's choir. She hired all these musicians. It cost $5,000 to make this thing. And, it, and she put her whole heart into it, but it's beautiful. I did, don't you think, uh, Linda? And, and so, yeah, she's telling people she's going to do a little sing along coming up here. I'm trying to remember the day. The 10th. She just said December 10th. At what time? Six, six o'clock. She's going to do a like a live, and she's going to sing sing some songs, Christmas songs, and so everybody's invited. We'll, we'll send out. That was the thing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Well, I look forward yeah. to seeing her live, too, because that I don't have anybody here to have any kind of holiday with, and I don't really even know how to have a Christmas, so where, I'm going to tune in. To, hmm? Where are you at? I'm in Virginia. Virginia, okay. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Well, yeah, I have. Oh, I'd love to. I've got about 30 oak trees on my little tiny lot here, but I do miss seeing those mountains. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Boise surrounded by them. I didn't know there was that many mountains out here, but, man, we're only 400 miles from Montana and, you know, Yellowstone Park, 600, I think, and, you know, Seattle. Oh, I've Washington, been there many, Colorado. many times. Where, where Are you near an airport? Yeah, Boise Airport, yep. Yeah. Oh, that could happen. I know, yeah. We have a room, don't we, Angela? We've got a room you can stay in, a really nice room. It's kind of a guest house, and we also have, like, a little chapel on the back, a glass house that sits on the river, and it's oh, heated, and it's really nice just to go out and have coffee. And anytime you're welcome, anytime all you guys are, Linda James, you, and anybody else listening, anytime you I'm guys want to come. I'm not going to be surprised. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, 100%. We'll spoil you. All right. Well, maybe next, when the spring happens, let's do this thing. Let's do it. Let's do it. We'll have a blast. We can go wherever. We'll go to Anacortes if you want, which is not too far. And I, I mean, there's some cool places to go, and we'll have some fun in Boise, too. Yeah. Sounds good, Pixie. Awesome. Yeah. That's exciting. Well, who's left in the chat? I came in late. It's 2.30 here. Oh, you know who? I mean, you know who came up to speak is um, they're not. Um, what am I thinking of? Oh, Graham Hancock. The archaeologists aren't laughing at him anymore. He is wonderful. Check out Graham Hancock. Okay. 
got a book. For the he's got a book. He's got a book about prehistory. He's got a book a book called um, Oh Supernatural about Native American stuff. He's wonderful. So. You know, I, um, 